Hello, hello. What's up, everybody? Okay, we should be looking good now. So say what's up. Say hi to everybody. Say where you're calling in from. Hit the little polls thing that we've we've dropped in. We'll start here in a couple minutes. So get ready, get some water, get stretched out. <laughs> we're going to have a fun time today. It's going to be a fun call. Uh, we're going to go live through this whole thing. We're going to map it all out. The whole nine yards should be a freaking hoot. So uh, get ready, everybody. Um, let me know if things aren't looking good or the chat's not working like like help us out. Like if something's not right or something's not feeling good, let me know. So we'll keep watching the videos and we'll get started in just a few minutes. Sound good? See you guys in a minute. Just to rewrite history, cause I'm in the mood to Label us the leaders of the leaders of the new school This ain't for the radio, can't find this on YouTube This the type of killing that these critics ain't used to Victorious 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 in this day and age, I got time for innovation Time to be creative, time too big to waste All my time on critics hating Flattered by your opinions to show you I'll just embrace it Now watch a worldly sunrise up No daylight savers go nuts when I have to Glaze built my sound in this beast on the house that we dreaming Watch me way back up in the gas when my thoughts are distorted Cause I recall guys were hating Uncommonly all of them became common denominators Hold up Try to overlook a rival on me cause I got no competition Now looking at an idol Your door ain't long enough to pay for my attention Man, it's the gospel for the black sheep I guess it got a banging ring to it Quiet with triumph on the rap lead So all of you mother can sing to it I was born to be victorious Most definitely victorious I'm destined to be victorious Statistics occasionally were quit it Pay reality visits, but it was too hard to live it Build them my confidence and deliver it Now I be burning these critics Cause they ain't know they was walking their course While burning they bridges, hold up Man, whoever thought I'd be rapping The family ain't never think that can happen Matter of fact, only person that ever pushed me to get out Was my mother and the only reason was cause I can track Heard that comments, that shit that you put a ring on And by the looks at your life, guess she's a cling on It's on me, dudes had they lead on the board But game change over time, so I even the score Young is bedded up, learn how to step it up Must to be shafted up, set it up City they wrapped enough, even the rest of us Going off, so of course, maybe we're shown or throwing it off so you know, like Yo, what's up? What's up? All right, we're going live in a few minutes here. Say hello to everybody. Hit the poll. Say where you're calling in from. You can even start networking with people, you know, talk about what industry you're doing or I'm doing real estate in a certain area. And you can even, yeah, this is like, this is, this is fun. We're live on here. Start talking to people. Say hi, say what's up. We'll get going in a few minutes. I got to run to the bathroom, get ready. And once we get started, we are going to fly through this. So give us, we're going to start uh, right at the top of the hour. So give us a, give us a few minutes. We'll be going. Um, I'll keep running videos though for you guys and, and say what's up. What's up, you guys? Good to see you. Joe, Chris. Good to see you, uh, uh, Khalil. Good to see you. Welcome in, you guys. Welcome in, welcome in. Um, okay, we'll go live in a few minutes here. This day is gonna be the greatest memory. Making history. Let's go. Get ready for it. Get ready for it. Get ready for it. Yeah, this is it. Go! 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 Yeah, this is it. Go! Go! Let's go! This is it. Yeah, this is it. Take 
ready for it. Get ready for it. Get ready for it. are the crazy 1% who believes they can change the world. The crazy 1% who stop at nothing. And what's crazy enough about the crazy 1% is they're actually the ones who change the world. I wanted to have regular people or people like you guys have access to the same thing that I had access to. I mean, it's just like what Tony Robbins says, proximity is power. This event is insane. The only person that you'll meet at Fun Launch Live is second to none. Yo, what's up, people? Hello, hello. Um, good to see everybody in here calling in from look at we got a bunch of people in here from New York, Maine, Indiana. Um, we're starting in just a few minutes, top of the hour, we're getting going. So um say hello. By the way, make sure you chat to everyone in the chat. Don't do hosts and panelists. Um, if you're chatting, just and say hi to people. Um, come in here. Um, say hello. And yeah, somebody's asking, he's, I'm saying hi to people that didn't say they were in the court. They're in the, they're messaging me on hosts and panelists. So make sure you message me on to everyone, say hello to everyone on there. Um, and, uh, say on there, cause I get private messages for you guys, but make sure to say it to everyone so that everyone will see your chat on there. Hit the, um, hit the links on it. What's up? Hey guys, let's go after it. <laughs> LOL. Yeah. Gotcha. There you go. Um, <laughs> hello hello yeah make sure to say to everyone people keep messaging me to hosts and panelists make sure that your little chat button says to everyone we're gonna start and let me just run real quick i gotta run to the bathroom get stretched out real quick we're gonna start at the top of the hour in just a couple minutes so we'll get rolling i'll play like one more video and we'll get rolling okay All right. All right, people. We are to the top of the hour here. Let's get rolling. We, um, hello. Good to see everybody. Welcome in. Welcome in. Um, uh, happy webinar day. You guys are amazing. Happy to be on. We're going to fumble and this thing. This thing is live. We are running with it. So it's going to be a good time. So say hello to everybody. Um, I'm going to drop a few polls, other questions in the chat. Um, if you guys can real quick, I'm just by way of survey. Good to see everybody. Um, Fort Lauderdale, Warmth and sunshine. That's awesome. New York, uh, 
I, so yeah, I'm actually in Salt Lake City, Utah right now. And we're going to talk about investment funds today. We're going to talk about 2023. We're going to talk about how to prep and launch a fund um, in 2023. I launched a fund last year, actually um, in the middle of a crypto crash, we launched a crypto fund. <laughs> if you can believe that we raised $10 million for that fund. We're still raising money for that fund. It's actually done very well. Um, I'm now a, pro uh, a partner on six different funds. And uh, we've helped now, I think over, what were we at, Mason? Th 35,000, 40,000 people in our groups. 40,000 people in our groups and communities, which is absolutely insane, which is so cool. So just so everyone's aware, but behind the scenes, I got Mason Brains, my, my co-founder, business partner. We've also got um, Matt and, and who else is on here? Matt. Matt's the other main one. And a few other moderators are coming and help. So if you guys have questions, and sometimes I'm talking so fast. So if you guys don't have questions, they're live. They can chat with you. Send them a private message. Or um, if you put a message in, they might message you privately just to help you out if there's something going on. Because I just, we're going to roll, baby. We're going to fly through this thing. So welcome in, everybody. Good to see you guys. Um, if you can in the chat, I'm actually curious. Um, how many people, this is your very first time hopping on a Zoom call with me? So if this is your first time, type in like a one. If this is your second time, type in two, three, four. And if it's five, just do like five plus. Type it in the chat there. A uh, little poll for everybody. And actually, maybe we might be able to even launch a poll here. Um, but yeah, type in the chat. I want to see, uh, I want to see what everyone's in. Okay. A lot of people, this is your first time. Really cool. Um, welcome in you guys are, are you guys are in for a treat today? We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, as you know, finance can be very boring and slow and, uh, methodical. And, uh, I like to make it pretty fun. <laughs> I like to have a lot of fun. We'll do giveaways today. We're going to go fast. I want to answer questions. We're going to pull out. I got the whiteboard here. We're showing whiteboard stuff out things that don't make sense to you. Well, I'm going to stay on, dude. You guys better buckle in because we're going to die. I want you to, I want you to, after the, at the end of this thing, to feel like you've got a full, like, slew of everything you need to know. And again, most people look at this, how crazy this is. Most people, this is your first time ever hopping on a call. So, you know what? In, in, uh, just, just to, just because I'm such a hater on the traditional boring finance, we're going to do a giveaway right now at the beginning of this call. Okay. So, how, how these giveaways work is this is your first time. What we do, is I'm going to give you a keyword or phrase to say in the chat. Make sure you're typing to everyone, okay? Um, it's got to be to everyone. I'm going to scroll through and I'm just going to ask somebody, you have like four or five seconds to type it in. Pretty easy. We might do some other, we do competitions sometimes. Anyways, for this first one, we'll just keep it easy. So for $100 to Amazon, $100 to Amazon, type yes in the chat if you guys are ready to get going. So type yes in the chat. For $100 to Amazon, I'm going to pick somebody in five, four, three, two, one. Hello. Hello. Wow. There's a lot of people on here. Okay. What's up? Make sure you're typing to everyone as well. Uh, Rodney Gibson. Okay. Rodney, dude, Rodney, you got a hundred dollars going your way to Amazon. So what you're going to do right now, um, either Mason or Matt's going to message you or message them privately, send them uh, your email address privately. Don't send it to everybody, send it privately. And we'll send you over email, um, a hundred dollar gift card. Boom. We're like two minutes into this thing. We've already given away hundred bucks, which is kind of fun. So, all right. Welcome in you guys. Good to see y'all. Um, and then finally, if you guys can in the chat, um, I want to hear what industries y'all work in. So if you're in real estate, type in real estate, if you're, if you're in, and maybe put a little clarification, I'm in single family real estate or multifamily real estate. If you're industrial, if you do Forex trading, if you trade securities or options or crypto, if you do private equity, if you buy businesses, if you do, um, a debt fund, you issue loans, if you, um, do venture capital type that in the chat. I'm just curious, kind of a poll of where everyone's at. Now, if you're like, I don't even know anything, just be like, dude, I'm brand new. I'm here to learn. <laughs> just say, just say that. And, uh, we'll, uh, we'll roll with that. And there's no, no hard feelings against that. I'm just curious what industries people are at least interested in. Maybe if you're brand new type in what one you're interested in, maybe I'm, okay, I'm brand new, but I'm interested in multifamily real estate or I'm brand new. I'm interested in trading options. That would help too. Gives us kind of a, a, a poll of where everyone's at. And again, make sure it's typed into everyone in here um, as well. A lot of you guys are still sending me private messages. Quant fund, real estate, betting and gambling. Really cool. Real estate hedge funds, here to learn. Awesome. Um, buy businesses. Okay, we're going to talk about all of that today um, as we dive in. So, you know what? I think if people are late, they're late. What do you think, Mace? Should we get going? Let's go for it. Let's just get rolling. You guys good? Type a yes in the chat if you guys are ready to get rolling. We're Once we get started, we're going to get rolling fast. And I think let's just get going. So today we're going to talk about how to launch a fund without working on Wall Street for 20 plus years, specifically to 2023 with a recession looming or maybe a recession's already here or it's coming, right? Uh, what does that mean for us and how do we do this? So that's what we're going to talk about today. So quick, uh, real quick results disclaimer. What I'm sharing is my personal opinion. This is not financial legal advice. Um, if you guys can in the chat, again, I'm going to, and by the way, before I go any further, um, I do a lot of callbacks. 
And I do that because it's fun, number one. But psychologists actually tell us if you come to a webinar or something like this and you sit there and listen, you will remember about 0% of the content that you heard. I think back to three months ago, whatever. A lot of us, we remember close to zero. If you take notes while you're listening, that goes from zero, it jumps to about four to 5% of the content you'll remember long-term. If you use your voice, your body, if you engage, if you type in a chat, if you somehow are engaged in the, in the conversation, that number jumps from 5% to 13 to 20% at the top end, which is pretty cool. Okay. So who's down to get to 20%. If you guys are going to spend uh, time as our most valuable asset, if you're going to spend time with me today live, I want you guys to get the most out of it. So again, I'm going to ask there. I'm not just doing callbacks just for fun or just for me. Uh, I do it for us so that we can both remember and you guys can help remember all the stuff we're talking about today. Sound good. Okay. So um, if, if that's cool, type in like, I, I want to get to 20%. Okay. Type in, I want to get to 20%. Again, this is for us to be, if you're engaged, if you're typing, if you're taking notes, it just helps you remember more stuff. Now, um, again, I'm not, not sharing financial legal advice. I'm not selling securities. I just want to share personal opinions. Some of our results are unusually high. Don't expect those for yourself. Sound good? Everyone feel like I, you're disclaimed, okay? Um, in the chat, I love it. Thank you guys for typing in the chat. That helps so much. I think it makes it just, just a better experience for everybody. All right, let's dive into it. So real quick, I'm not here to talk about myself like crazy, but I think it's important for you to know who I am, my background. So my name is Bridger Pennington. I started two funds in my twenties. I'll share some of those stories in a minute. Um, we raised and deployed millions of dollars out of those funds. My second fund I actually sold. We had a competitor come in and buy us out, which was really cool. It was about a, uh, it was a year and a half ago, Mace, something like that. Year and a half ago, a competitor came, bought my entire fund, had a nice exit on that. And then since then, uh, middle of last year, I launched a new fund in crypto. So we launched a crypto hedge fund. And I, again, I'm not going to, people are asking me questions about crypto in here. I am not a crypto expert. Okay, I'm good at funds. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'm very good at funds. My partners are incredible at crypto. So I partner with a couple of incredible partners that just are bonkers at crypto. And we've actually performed very well as a fund. It's been awesome to run that fund. It's been really cool. We raised $10 million on our initial launch. We're still raising money for that, which is really cool. Um, and we're running that right now. So I do that. Those that's we've been featured on Bloomberg and a bunch of other stuff. This is me and Mason. So Mason behind the scenes. Uh, we actually we launched another company called Fund Launch, which you guys can kind of see here today, where we actually teach people about investments. Um, I felt I'll tell the story in a minute, but I felt so blessed by my background and story and was able to learn funds that I think other people should learn about funds as well. And uh, we've done pretty well in this this business, and and it's been awesome. And we've actually done I think sixteen or seventeen million in sales in about two years, helping people launch funds, which is so cool. Now, as I say that. Another disclaimer, today, I have nothing to sell you today. You can't buy anything on this webinar. Sometimes you guys hop on calls, people like pitch you all day on something. That's not today. Today, I really want to come and I want to share value. I want to just teach. I want to educate. I want to help more people learn how this game of funds works. Does that sound good? If you're with me, type yes in the chat. Does that, does that work, you guys? Okay, let's get into it. So um, this is me real quick. If you guys uh, don't look out for the, sc the scammer bot accounts online, but Bridger underscore Pennington on TikTok, YouTube, wherever we're at is my account. Um, so here we are. Um, this is our event we threw last year. I'm actually curious in the chat, who came to this event? This is Fund Launch Live 2022. We were in Las Vegas. We had 1,200 people. We sold out the entire event about a month before, which was insane. People coming to learn about funds of all things, right? Um, which is really cool. It's a three-day event, uh, crazy event. We are high energy. If you can't tell, we do a lot of cool stuff. Again, I want people engaged up and running. It's, it's pretty cool. So um, with that, a couple of you guys are there. Okay, really cool. Um, hello, let me pull up this chat. I want to see the chat here right in front of me. Um, really cool, you guys. It's awesome. Um, today, we want to talk about this though. I want to talk about a fund is the best way for you to scale your business or investment. So current business owners in here, I'm going to talk about how you can build a fund to go and potentially buy out your competitors. You can launch a fund to go. We had one guy in our group. He had a huge, I won't give all the details, but one of the largest hydrogen plants in the United States, guys in our group. And he's like, I want to launch another facility. So he launched an outside fund. That fund raised the capital. He kept his original business. He didn't give up any equity in his original business, launched an outside fund to build all of his new facilities for him. It was pretty cool. So you can scale your business and then also your investments. We have a guys we'll share in a minute, but guys that are house flippers, people that are, are uh, home gamers, traders, you bolt a fund on it. Now, instead of trading 50 grand, they're trading 5 million or 10 million or 30 million, which is pretty cool. Okay. So we're gonna talk about this game of funds, what funds are, all that kind of stuff. Does that sound good? You guys with me say yes. Okay. Uh, let's do it. Let's dive in. So um, we're talking about this. My goal for our short time together is how to talk about how I was able to start two funds in my twenties to play millions of dollars without a track record, without working on Wall Street, without some fancy Ivy League degree and how you should be thinking about using this. We're gonna talk about the fund launch formula. It's a four-step formula to launch funds. Okay. Um, additionally, this is kind of what we're gonna, we're gonna talk about today as a structure. So um, 
Number one, we're going to talk about the secret structure of a 10 plus billion dollar fund. I actually have a couple incredible mentors that run Deco billion dollar funds. And we actually have people in our, in our group that are right near actually a $10 billion fund. I'm going to show you the structure of how they're structured together and the behind the scenes of how these work, which is pretty cool. Number two, we're going to talk about how you can ethically steal your competitors, investors, and launch a fund in a, an efficient way. This is through the fund launch form. It's going to be pretty fun. We're going to dive into that. And then number three, we're going to talk about the strategic and economic advantage of launching a fund in 2023. I have a bunch of charts and data I want to share exactly for right now, what we're seeing in 2023, what is going on and how you guys, at least I think a lot of the guys I talk to are very excited for 2023, how to make a ton of money right now, um, especially with the fund, which is kind of cool. Does that sound good? Does that sound fair? Is that cool if we talk about it? Yeah, today? All right, let's dive into it. So now again, I said this before, you can't buy anything on this webinar today. I am not, this is not like some pitch, like secret thing. I really want to come and share a ton of value. So I just want to clarify that again. I'm here for you guys. Okay. Does that sound fair? All right, let's dive into it. So I want to talk about this first. Um, starting a fund is the most lucrative vehicle in the world. Now we're going to talk about, we're going to start basic. We're going to start what, what even is a fund. So some of you guys are like brand new. Like, I don't even know what you're talking about, Bridger. That's okay. Rest assured, I'm going to, I want to help you out. We're going to start about what, what a fund is. We're going to go very simple to very advanced. We're going to talk about international feeder structures, the whole nine yards. And by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to stay on at the end for a Q and a, um, I've got my iPad here. We're going to do a Q and a, I can sit here for, I don't know, however long you guys want hours. If you guys, maybe not too long. I got, I got, I got like in three hours, I got a thing, but like we can stay on for a while and answer questions for you guys. Sound good. Okay. So starting a fund is the most lucrative vehicle on the planet. These are all fund managers right here. Okay. You got Izzy Englander, Jim Simons, Ken Griffin, Daniel Loeb. Now, what's interesting about this, these are not their net worths. So that's not Jim Simon's net worth at $3.6 billion, which is an amazing amount of money. Because you know, net worth, right? Like, so Elon Musk, his net worth is a lot reflected by Tesla stock. So his net worth goes up if Tesla stock goes up, his net worth goes down if Tesla stock drops. He's, I think his net worth dropped $80 billion last year because Tesla stock fell a lot. I'm not talking net worth because net worth's like on paper. Okay. The numbers you see on the screen, aren't these guys net worth? Those are their 2021 earnings alone, just from one income source, their fund. So when I say running a fund is the most lucrative vehicle on planet earth, I mean it. Okay. <laughs> like Ken Griffin right here, he's making over $150 million a month from one income source. That's not his, that's not his personal portfolio. That's not his properties. That's just his fund that's paying him. I don't even know what I would do with $150 million a month coming to me every month. You'd have to have a team of people, how to deploy that, how to put it in charities. Like, what are you going to do with that? Like, it's freaking insane. To put it in perspective, Daniel Loeb at the bottom, uh, 920 million, the lowest guy in this list. So January, 2021, let's just say this house in the bottom is a $9 million home. He had a, or an $8 million home. He had enough money January 1st at 6 p.m. He had already made $8 million. His first work day of the year running his hedge fund, okay? Who wants that problem in their life? Anybody want that? Like that's, a, you know, it's a problem having money. I would love, anybody want that problem? <laughs> okay, I'll take that problem. Yeah, you know, like let's let's do it, right? Um, so, uh, let's, let's talk about what is a fund, how funds work, how they're put together. Sound good. Now let me take you back a little bit. Um, this is a, a couple of years ago with me. So I, uh, I was pro uh, probably like a lot of you guys, I got into college. So I got into high school, went on a two-year LDS mission to Taiwan, which was amazing. I learned Mandarin Chinese. It was awesome. I come home and I am like a kid with my hair on fire. I am, I was very ambitious and I'm like, I'm going to make money. And the best way to make money is to start businesses, right? I started six different businesses my first two years of college. And actually me and Mason started a couple of those businesses. It was really fun. Um, but I, we were doing everything. I, I was actually, we had a Chinese tutoring business. I had six different tutors that were working for me. I wholesaled two houses. Anybody a wholesaler in here? Wholesale two houses. We built websites for people. We did a Forex trading thing. Like I did every business under the sun. Like you could find on YouTube. I tried all of them. And finally my dad grabs me and he's like, Bridger, you're kind of like a chicken with your head cut off. Um, I want to help you out a little bit. And so he goes, I want you to go meet with my business partner. I think this guy can really help you. I said, okay, cool. Like I'll go meet with whoever. Right. And so I, uh, I set this appointment up. I drive to this guy's house and I, um, I head up there and I pull through this gated community and, and granted, I grew up in a pretty normal house, nothing bad, nothing great. My dad drove a car with 200,000 miles on it, dent in the door, just, but was, we had a okay, like good life, nothing crazy, but, um, that's kind of the life we lived. And so I drove to this guy's house. I pull up, it's a gated community. I'm like, wow, it's a nice area. 
I drive to this guy's house. I pull up this cul-de-sac and it's this beautiful, gorgeous home on this cul-de-sac. I was like, holy crap, like, who is this guy? Park my car, I get out, I go knock on the door and I'm worried like, you know, like a butler is going to come and like, be gone peasant, like get out of here, right? <laughs> and I was all worried. And thankfully my dad's business partner answers the door. He goes, Bridger, come on. And he brings me in this house and it's gorgeous. He's got the grand piano. He's got the cars in the garage, the pool in the backyard, the basketball court in the basement. I think it's just gorgeous. And I walk in, I sit down these big couches and to make a long story short, we start to chat. We start talking about business and life. And finally, I ask him this. I go, how did you get all of this? Like, how did you do this? And he goes, funny enough, Bridger, not a lot of people ask me that question. And I was like, oh, shoot. Like, that's the first question I had. Like, uh, that's the, and I'm sorry if I offended you, but that's the only question I had. He's like, no, no, it's fine. But he goes, Bridger, in my 20s, I was a lot like you. He goes, I started a bunch of little businesses. I actually made a good amount of money. He goes, then I figured out the secrets of the rich. Because I figured out the secrets of the ultra wealthy of the world. And I was like, okay. And he goes, I met a guy that ran a private equity fund. And he was one of the wealthiest guys I had ever met in my entire life. And he goes, I don't care. I didn't care how long it took me. I don't care if it took me one year, five years, or 20 years. He goes, I was going to learn what a fund was, how to start one and how to scale one. He goes, that's exactly what we did. And uh, he goes, at the time, he goes, we manage about $8 billion of real estate. $8 billion. Okay. To put that into perspective, you guys, anybody know Grant Cardone in the chat? You guys know Grant Cardone? Type like a yes or something. If you guys know Grant Cardone. Uncle G, right? And nothing against Uncle Grant, Grant Cardone, but Car Cardone Capital, I think today manages about $4 billion. And this is years ago. So at the time, they were twice as big as Cardone Capital, which is crazy. And then, and actually, as I'm fast forward to, to today, they're over $40 billion, these guys manage, which is unreal. Like they're 10 times bigger than Cardone Capital, right? Like 10X, 10X Grant Cardone, right? <laughs> Yo, what's up, Uncle G? Um, but it was pretty crazy, right? So they're 10 times bigger than Grant Cardone. So I, I'm like, dude, okay. And I've heard from groups like this and webinars and stuff, find a mentor, right? You got to go find a mentor. Your mentor's going to help you out. So I said, dude, can you be my mentor? I, I'll get your coffee in the morning. I'll come work for free, whatever you need. But like, let me just learn from you. And he says, Bridger, go talk to your dad. He's like, your dad knows way more about this than I do. And I said, no, no, no. My dad's kind of broke. We're poor. You're rich. Like, I want to learn from you. And he goes, Bridger, um, sorry to break it to you, but me and your dad make about the same amount of money. And my chin dropped to the floor. I was like, huh? Come again? What? He's like, yeah, me and your dad are pretty much equal business partners in this. And I, dude, I left the dude's house. I drove straight to my dad's house and I was like, dad, what the heck? Like, what's going on? Like, why haven't I been able to order a soda at Chipotle because it's too expensive. And yet you're managing billion dollar funds bigger than Grant Cardone. Like, wh like what's going on? What's the disconnect? And anyways, uh, long story short, my dad, um, he kind of laughed. He said, yeah, you know, I like, I like to save and invest my money. My partner likes to spend his money, but, but yeah, we run these big funds and, and actually kudos to my dad, man. He just lived a millionaire next door life stuff. You read that book. He just lived that to a T. And so long story short, I started to go meet with my dad every Sunday night. I'd go to his house. He'd whiteboard this out for me and taught me about funds. And this is what I'm going to share with you right now is what he taught me about funds. We're going to share a different piece of this, but is that cool if we get into it right now? Sound good? Type a yes in the chat if you guys are ready to get into it. Sound good? All right. So in the most basic sense, what is a fund? Okay. All a fund is, is a pool of money. Investors put money into that pool. People like me and you fund managers, we draw from that pool. We go and make investments. We buy assets. We invest in something. Whenever those assets make money, they flow back to the pool and then they get split between ourselves and our investors. That's it, okay? It's not that crazy. Like this is one of the oldest business models on planet earth. Like you look back like uh, Christopher Columbus, right? He was like, hey, give me some money. We're gonna go to the new world. We're gonna get a bunch of gold. We're gonna bring it back and we'll split the spoils, right? Like it's not that complex. So then- and by the way, we've helped in the last year. So right here. Um, so what's the difference then between private equity, hedge funds, real estate funds, debt funds? By the way, we've helped, uh, we helped 120 funds launch last year. I've helped every one of these private equity, hedge funds, real estate funds, debt funds. I'm actually a partner now in six different funds. So I see that what I get to see is the back end of all these funds, how they're put together. And the craziest thing is they all run almost exactly the same way. They're actually not that different. The only difference, oh, let me go back. Uh, the only difference here, is what they invest into. So like, what is a private equity fund? 
a private equity fund, all it is, is a pool of money. Investors put money in that pool, same thing. And what the, the, the only difference is the assets they buy, the bottom piece. So a private equity firm, they buy private equity. They buy privately held businesses. So for example, uh, Sycamore Partners on Wall Street, major private equity firm. Anybody heard of Sycamore Partners? Give me the chat. Probably not. I was actually speaking at two events last week. Raise your hands. It was like two people in the whole room. We had like 200 people there. Two people knew who Sycamore Partners was. And I said, uh, do you guys know uh, Staples? Like the department store Staples? Do you know Nine West Shoes, Aeropostale? If you heard of Kohl's department store? And I think, I'm not sure if the acquisition went through for Kohl's. They're all owned by Sycamore Partners. Last year, they were trying to buy Victoria's Secret. That's a private equity firm. They gobble up all these brands. A lot of the brands and TV shows and stuff you watch are all owned by the same company, which is kind of crazy. It's private equity. We help people do micro private equity. We have people in our group that like have a restaurant and then they go out and buy up all their competitors and pull them into one pool. And now they have this kind of micro private equity strategy. Isn't that kind of interesting? Um, but in just a minute, I'm going to share an example of a gun store. This guy did it with a gun store, bought the, hit all of his competitors out. It's pretty cool. I'll share that in a minute. That's private equity. Does that make sense? Okay. You guys follow along so far? Okay. So again, What's a hedge fund then? The only difference, again, same thing, investors pool money, the assets are different. So instead of buying privately held business, a hedge fund buys public securities or public stocks, bonds, options, crypto, Forex. They're a fund that buys, let's say we're in a crypto hedge fund. We're a hedge fund, a pool of money that buys crypto, which is a publicly traded asset. It's not that crazy, you guys. The one thing I hate about finance is how confusing they make it, like everything sound. This isn't that crazy. Right? You guys follow along? Type a yes in the chat. That's kind of making some sense. Real estate funds, okay? It's in the name. It's a pool of money. Instead of buying private companies or instead of buying crypto, they buy real estate, okay? Pool of money that buys real estate. It flows back to the investors and goes from there. Debt funds, they issue debt. Okay, so debt funds issue loans, mortgages. My first two funds were debt funds. I actually issued small loans to businesses. We got paid back and I'll actually share that example in a few minutes. Sound good? This is making sense. Okay, it's not that crazy. This world of funds, it sounds so crazy and so hard. It's it's really not that crazy. We're gonna share some more examples in a minute, but is that kind of helping? So now who this works for? This works for people in trading, crypto, Forex, futures, real estate, buying and selling small business, investing in startups, scaling existing business, issuing loans, debt. This is the world of funds, which is pretty cool, okay? Um, now to kind of finish that story back with my dad, right? So I'm with my dad. My dad's teaching me this kind of stuff and we'll get more exa examples, but there's a funny thing in your brain that when you start to learn something, you start to recognize that thing in your life. Like anybody ever bought a new car? Like you go buy a new Mercedes and all of a sudden you start seeing that same Mercedes driving around everywhere, right? Um, same thing happened for me with funds. So at the time I was 22 years old, I was in college. I started to learn about funds. And I was, so I was in college, I was working a job and working at an internship, this startup. And um, I had this crazy idea at the start. I'm like, dude, I could start a fund in this business. The clients that were coming through this fund needed financing. So I went and talked to the owner of the company and I was like, Hey, we could finance some of the clients coming and give them a loan, a short-term loan. They could pay us back in like 30 to 60 days. They love the idea. I then went and talked to my dad. We sat down, we mapped this whole entire fund out, which is pretty fun. So we mapped this whole thing out, got it all together. And I was pretty sad. So I'm 22 years old at the time. I got this little fun ready to go. And then I was, and then I hit this wall. I was like, shoot, I've got to go raise money. Right. And I, for whatever reason, I overlooked like finding investors. Like, and I was like, crap, like who's going to invest in me? I'm, I'm in college. I have no track record. Like who's going to invest in me? And so, and then I thought, aha, little, little light bulb went off. My dad, right? Like my dad's rich, apparently doesn't spend his money on fancy cars or houses. He would probably love to invest in my fund, right? So I'll go pitch my dad to invest in our fund. So I remember it was a late Sunday night. I walked in my dad's little home office, sat down with him. And uh, I said, dad, I want to thank you so much for helping me put this together. And he really was, he was an incredible mentor, helped me put together this fund. And I said, dad, in my best pitch voice possible, I said, dad, how would you like to be our first investor into our fund? I said, just like that handout and everything, right? Look him right in the eyes. And he kind of laughed and he said, uh, Bridger, he goes, I have the money to invest, but if I invest in your fund, it would ruin the experience of you raising money on your own. And he goes, that'll be a crutch that you'll never be able to recover from. And he said, no. And uh, it was a big tough love moment between me and my dad. And he kicked me out. And he said, you got to go learn how to do this on your own. And I walked out with my tail between my legs a little bit. And uh, anyways, I went out, I hit the streets. I talked to everybody I knew. 
I talked to former bosses, college professors. Um, I talked to like neighbor, whoever it was. And after about four weeks of pitching, I raised a whopping $49,500 from like six different investors. And some of you guys might be like, wow, that's great. That's like, that's like teeny. That's probably one of the smallest funds ever to launch, right? $49,500, but it was enough to get started. We were doing these small micro loans. Like the loans were like three to $5,000 per client. They were short term, like 36 days. So we could start this fund. We launched our, this first little syndicate fund. And I got my first group of investors, a 64% return on their money, which was awesome. So again, small dollar amount, but good return. So we kind of closed that down. We restructured it, launched the same strategy. Um, we raised and deployed millions of dollars out of that next fund. I ran that for about three and a half, four years. And then, like I said earlier, we had a competitor come and buy us out. I actually exited a fund, sold my entire fund, which was really cool. I had a good exit on that. And then um, since then, we launched Fund Launch. We started to teach people about funds and all that kind of stuff. And still to this day, my dad has still never invested in any deal, project, fund, anything I've ever launched. But my dad has been an incredible mentor and coach for me. He's not a partner in any of my business or anything, but he's an incredible coach and mentor. Additionally, my brother is also a securities attorney for funds. So my brother actually does all the legal work for funds, which is so cool. He works at the largest law firm in the world for funds. So um, between the three of us, we have some pretty cool background on that. So a lot of people started to come to me and my dad and my brother and started to ask us, hey, how do I do a fund? How do I build one? None of us went to Harvard. None of us did Ivy League schools. All of us just had this kind of roundabout way of getting into the fund world. So we started fund launch. We started to teach people how to do funds, how to launch them. And we've actually um, helped a number of people launch their funds. This is actually an award we give out to anybody in our group that gets over $10 million in their fund. Um, last year on stage, I think we had 14 or 15 funds come up on stage and accept their reward. Um, right now, we just did a survey. We have one student fund over a billion dollars, four student funds over a hundred million and 54 student funds between one and $50 million, which is so freaking crazy, okay? Um, which is so cool. These are some of the groups here. These guys raised $500 million trade index funds. Uh, Amit, they raised 3.4 million here. Soft commitments for under a million dollars in 10 days for a hotel to condo conversion in Rio de Janeiro. Um, this is John R. He raised $10 million for his hedge fund. Dana raised $65 million for his real estate fund. Um, this is David D. $9 million in commitments for his crypto fund. Amika right here, fifth, he wants to buy 15 sustainable food companies. Re like really cool. You've got Blake Vaughn uh, raised $3.45 million, which is so cool. Um, this guy, we're gonna share this story in a minute. He went from flipping four homes a year to 72 homes in one year. Any house flippers in the group? He did that by doing a fund, which is so cool. We're gonna share his example in just a minute. Um, Brent Campbell raised $3 million, uh, $400,000 last month. Right here, it's just crazy to see all the people that are raising money, um, which is so cool. And by the way, we are throwing our next event here in a couple months. And you guys heard of Fun Last Live. If you guys were here in the beginning, you saw the videos. You guys want to see kind of the behind the scenes renders of how what it's going to look like? You saw a little peek a second ago. You guys want to see it? Type a yes in the chat if that works. By the way, let's do a little giveaway right now. What do you think, Mace? $100? Let's do it. All right, let's do a $100 giveaway, kind of loosen things up, stretch out. And then we're going we're to dive into a bunch of content right now. So um, you guys ready in the chat, type in... Uh, I want to start a fund type in. I want to start a fund. I'm going to pick somebody for a hundred dollars to let's say Nike hundred dollars to Nike. I want to start a fund in the chat. Five, four, three, two, one. Wow. There's a lot of people. Okay. Let me grab somebody. Uh, man, I got to say this name, right? Jack, Jackies de Tong. Is that right? Is that how you say it? I'm, I'm butchered name. I'm so sorry, but is it just Jackie or Jack, Jackie Statong? You, you got a hundred dollars to Nike. So send Mason or Matthew or somebody behind the scenes, your email will send it to you right now. So congrats. There you go. Um, all right. Let's show you guys behind the scenes. This is the render for Fun Launch Live 2023, which is so sick. We got 2,500 people coming. It's going to be pretty awesome. Boom. Isn't that cool? That is an LED curved LED screen, which is pretty sick. Okay. <laughs> it's a huge, I don't know. It's like a 90 feet or something across the stage. It's going to be pretty fun. Um, this event. And we got Ed Milet coming, Jim Rogers. Um, so there's again, one more time. Sorry if you guys didn't see it. Um, we got Ed Milet, Jim, Jim Rogers coming May 10th through the 12th in the Miami Convention Center. Um, tickets are on sale. We sold out, by the way, a about a month before um, last time. So it's pretty cool. So, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, now, Bridger. Uh, and by the way, I want to just preface again, you guys, we're not selling anything today. We're not, you can't buy anything on this webinar, but I just want to throw this out here just so you guys see it. Um, now, Bridger. It's too hard to start a fund, right? I can't do this. No one will invest me. I don't have the partners. There's one person out there that has just broken through all glass ceilings for me. It's just changed my life completely. Um, this person is, you know, I think helping at least men all around the world do incredible things. Um, the fact that 
<clears throat> Pete Davidson dated Kim Kardashian means that me and you can do anything in this world. So stop saying, oh, funds are too hard. I can't figure it out. If this can happen, me and you can do freaking anything on planet earth. Okay. Type a yes in the chat. All right. <laughs> and I think he, didn't he date like all these other, who else did he date? He dated uh, like all these other crazy like models and Ariana Grande. That's right. He's dated like this guy, Pete Davidson, this guy, like, I mean, like, I guess he's got a nice bot or something, but I, I just like, I, the fact that this happens means me and you can do anything in this world. All right. Anything's possible. All right. So with that, <laughs> let's buckle up. Let's dive in. I'm, I'm going to jump into some content here. All right. We're going to go fast today. Um, and is it cool if we go quick? You guys good? All right. Let's talk about house flipping. All right. How, any house flipping in the chat? I'm going to share a bunch of examples of how funds work in real time. This is how one of our guys went from flipping four houses a year to 72 houses the next year using a fund. Okay. So right now I'm going to summarize uh, your house flippers. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to summarize your entire job in about 30 seconds. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong or off. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you got a house here. You go and you're like, I'm going to flip this house. This looks awesome. You go find hard money, investor money, or bank money, or your own money. You put that money together. You put it into an LLC, start a brand new little entity. The money flows in that LLC. You then go and you flip the house. You get contractors together, everything. You go flip the house. You then turn around and sell it. You make some cash money. Yeah, feeling good. <laughs> and then you do it again. You start over. You go find another house. You got to call up your investors again. Hey, we got a new house. You guys want to send money in? You get another hard money loan, whatever it is. Some LLC, you do this again. You flip houses. How did I do? Hard house flippers up pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> um, this is what I like to call the syndication loop, which actually is great. By the way, you can do this for buying businesses. You can do this for a lot of stuff. And it's actually, it works really well. It's really good at building a track record. My first fund was kind of like this, kind of like a syndication. Now, what we helped our guy do was because he's like, dude, I have such a problem. Every time I find a house, I got to recall my investors. I got to reset up a new entity. It just takes so much time. There's so much friction to flip another house. And so what we did for him, we went and set up a fund. And instead of, raising capital. Every time you find a house, you raise capital once you set up all the entities, the legal structure once. And out of all that, you can go flip as many houses as you want. So in the next year, literally he raised $5 million, flipped 72 homes. Oh, and by the way, because he was running a fund, he got better banking relationships. So his cost of capital, his interest rate would go down. So he could outbid and outcompete his competitors. Oh, also when he went to like the courthouse, instead of, you know, some of these house flippers are like, hey, okay, give me, I can close in 30 days, right? Give me 30 days. I got to call capital, get it together. He's like, hey, I'll close tomorrow. I got cash in the bank, proof of funds. In the chat, do you guys think you'd win more or less deals having a fund? Having cash ready to go, all set up, ready to, more or less deals? Probably more, right? Do you think you'd get better interest rates or worse interest rates if you had a lot of deals, a good relationship with a bank through a fund? Probably better, Right. This is how funds come and out compete regular little guys like me and you that are just trying to flip a little house here and there. Additionally, he had economies of scale because he had a fund. He could pay for full-time crews to go from house to he had like a full-time like tile and flooring team that would go from house to house. And then he had like a roofing team or a painting team or whatever team that would go carpet team that would just go from house to house. He had economies of scale, which brought his overall overhead down. He got better returns to his investors. Kind of interesting, right? There's a reason why last year, one in seven homes were purchased by funds. One in seven funds are becoming the only game in town. You got to learn this. This is why most people that are successful in business finance end up in a fund one day. Is that kind of making sense? You guys following along so far? Okay, let's do the next one. Um, e-commerce, anybody e-commerce in the chat? Does Amazon stores other stuff? So I want to share, this is a true example. I'm going to share round numbers, but a true example from some guys in our group, okay? So these guys want to do Amazon. They're actually very good at Amazon, um, but they didn't want to start brand new stores. There's a lot of headache with like starting up a brand new store. You got to build it up, get credibility. So what they did, they went and raised a quarter million dollars in a fund. There's my pool of money again, right? They raised a quarter million. And this, again, round numbers, let's say they buy five Amazon stores for $50,000 a piece, Okay, so they just buy existing stores. And by the way, there's a lot of kids that are 22 years old that are like, 50 grand, done. I'll sell you my store tomorrow, right? And because that's, that's, that's a lot of money to somebody when they're brand new starting out. And um, they bought five stores and they're actually good at Amazon. They scaled these stores up, put them under and they did all the cool stuff. I'm not an expert on Amazon, but they did all these cool things to, to help them grow. Within one year, those Amazon stores were performing very well. They net free cash flowed $350,000 net free cash flow. So what they did 
is they took the money, net free cash flow, and went and paid back all their investors plus a 20% return. So in their documents, they told investors, hey, if, if, if you guys in one year, if we get you a 20% return and pay you back all your capital, would you guys be happy? And they're like, yes, we'd love that. So they took just the cash flow. They didn't sell the businesses, just the cash flow, paid back all their investors plus a 20% return. And investors were so happy, like, man, I made 20% in one year with these guys. Sounds awesome. Let's do it again next year. And all this, and guess what they had? They kept the original, these business owners, they now have five businesses they own free and clear, about $3 million enterprise value that's net free cash flowing 350 grand a year. They went from zero to a $3 million enterprise value business doing that debt without any debt, any overhead. Who loves that? Isn't that kind of interesting? Isn't that kind of a cool idea? Type a yes in the chat. That's kind of making sense. You guys follow along? Okay, let's do a different one here. Um, I'm going to, again, I'm going, I'm going to go quick through these. You guys, and we'll just do questions at the end. Okay, so save your questions for the end. I'll just go quick. This will help you understand. This is a guy that did this with funeral homes, okay? True example. Now, again, I'm going to use round numbers, but true story of what he's doing. He found that he could uh, uh, buy and sell mom and pop funeral homes. He could buy them and sell them for about double to a larger private equity firm, okay? So for example, he raised $8 million here. Let's say, again, example round numbers. Let's say he went out and bought eight funeral homes for a million dollars a piece, okay? So here's our funeral homes, eight, a million dollars a piece. He groups them together. He then takes away overhead. He has a, a consistent management team. So it, it makes them more profitable. He groups them together in a portfolio in one year. He can turn around and sell that portfolio for $16 million to a larger private equity firm. Kind of cool, right? Makes an $8 million spread, not using any of his own money. Now he's got to pay back his investors. So he does, he does an 80, 20 split on them. So round numbers again, $8 million profit. He pays his investors 6.2 million. He takes home $1.8 million on this one deal every year. And if you do the math, I think in, I, somebody do the math for me, investors make on this deal something like 60 to 70% return in one year. So investors love it. Like, dude, that was amazing. That was the best deal we ever did. Let's do it again next year. He made 1.8 million. People work for years. People grind, me and you, grind our faces off to make $1.8 million in a year. And all he does is group these funeral homes together and sells them and he makes 1.8 million. Working smarter, not harder, right? This is how high finance work. This is how you get to the next level of business. It's kind of making sense. Yes, type yes in the chat. That's kind of making sense, okay? Kind of cool. I'm gonna share another, we're just gonna go examples, baby. This is gonna make sense. How this works in business. Any current business owners in the chat? Okay, so current business owners. This is an example of a guy calls me up. He goes, Bridger, I have a gun store. We do about five to 10 million revenue a year. Okay, right here. And this, this square represents his store and his entity and business. He's like, Bridger, I want to go buy my competitor stores out. So he goes, what do I do? Like, should I like get some debt? Should I like do like the shark tank route? Like go find an investor, give up 20% of my business. He's like, I don't want to give up 20% of my business. Like, this is like my baby. I don't want to give this thing up. And so I'm like, dude, do a third option. Okay. So what we put together for him, and he's still working on this right now. But this is the idea and what we're putting together for him. And we've helped other groups do this as well. Instead of giving, you leave your business exactly how it is today. You don't touch this square up here. It's the same. You start an outside fund. Okay, so here's our fund. We raise whatever amount of money we need. We raise it in a brand new fund. That fund goes and buys the competitor stores, an acquisition, okay, private equity. They go buy up all the competitor stores. The fund then contracts your company over here to run the stores for you. Because you're actually, you're good at running gun stores, right? You're like, you know how to do it. You know how to get inventory, all that kind of stuff. So we're going to pay you kind of like a franchise. We're going to pay you a corporate fee of 5% a year to just run the stores for us. So you get paid, he gets paid over here, running the stores for 5% a year. And he helps to get overhead. He can put his branding, his logos on everything. And all of a sudden now he has a monopoly of an entire area. He controls an entire market. And then as these competitor stores make money, just like any, any other fund, the money flows back. You pay your corporate fee. But the, the money flows back to the fund and gets split between the investors and the fund manager, which also happens to be him because he's also running the fund. So he makes money, a 80-20 split. So 80% goes to the investors, 20% goes to him because he put the fund together and does this on there. So he makes money running the fund, splitting with investors. He also makes money running the corporate fee and he makes money just running his current business operations. And all of a sudden now he has a monopoly of an entire area where he controls a lot of the stores in one area. Are your, are your wheels starting to turn a little bit? This is what's happening right now. If you guys look at like 
wiggy wash or quick quack car, you know, those car washes that are being built. They are, they are grabbing competitor stores or building new stores and taking over market share in business. That's one of the biggest things is like, how do I dominate market share? This is a quick, easy way to dominate market share. Isn't that kind of cool? Any like ah, type aha in the chat. That's kind of like a little light bulb went off. Isn't that kind of cool? Okay. This is how you can use funds for a business, which is so freaking cool. So now I want to go to the crazy zone with you. Okay. How this works in private equity or debt market. So let me tell you a quick story. My dad, as I mentioned my dad earlier, um, awesome dude, incredible mentor. Um, he's, you know, running this big fund and, and he gets sent to New York to go to an SEC conference. So this is for ma major funds. They're running a DECA billion dollar fund at the time. And uh, my dad's now since retired and he's all that kind of stuff. But at the time he's running there, he goes to the New York for a compliance conference. They're going to, uh, all the new rules, regulations are coming out. So he goes there and he's sitting at a table, uh, with so a couple other fund managers. So he's talking to this one guy, he goes, Hey, what do you guys do? And this guy explains to him. What I'm, I'm about to explain to you what they do with the fund and how they produce hundreds of millions of dollars a year on these simple little deals. Okay. It's pretty crazy. So you guys, so they're sitting at the table. This is what he, he describes to him. He goes, we run um, a fund with, with uh, big and small biotech companies. So he goes, for example, there's these big biotech companies out there and they want to purchase small biotech companies, like small in air quotes. <laughs> they're pretty big, but uh, for about, let's just say for $5 billion over five years. Okay. So a big biotech company is going to buy a, a small biotech company for $5 billion over five years. A lot of the times these small biotech companies, they don't want to wait five years to get paid out. So what we'll do, we'll approach them and say, Hey, um, instead of waiting five years, what if we pay you $4.5 billion right now? Okay. So we'll pay you $4.5 billion today. And then we will collect the $5 billion over five years. Does that work for you guys? And he goes, they love it. And they sign up, they go, I would, we would, because they want to move on to the next product. They don't want to wait five years. They want to get paid today and they can move on to other stuff. And so he goes, we come in and we facilitate this transaction. Do the math here. That's $500 million spread over five years. That's $100 million a year they make doing this one transaction. People work their entire lives. They grind their face. And if you're lucky enough, you will have a business that makes $100 million in one year, let alone five years. The odds that's like 0.00001% of businesses, right? They do this one transaction. They make $100 million a year for five years. That's it. That's all they do. And my dad asked him, he's like, well, so how big are you guys? How many deals like this do you do a year? He goes, right now we manage about a $35 billion fund. And he goes, we're actually trying to raise another 40 billion because we have so much demand just for this little arbitrage play right here. And it's a company you've never heard of. They're not on the Wall Street Journal getting talked about every day. He says, all we do is, and we only do biotech. We don't do other types of businesses. We only do biotech. They needed $80 billion, how much demand they have for just that arrangement. Isn't that kind of crazy? Okay, that is high finance. That's like, that's like the crazy zone. Is that kind of, is this helpful? You guys, you guys liking this so far? Give me, I need some feedback. In the chat. Is this like, is this like good? Um, <laughs> so kind of cool. Again, Bridget, there's no way I can do this. If Pete Davidson can date Kim Kardashian, we can do freaking anything in this world. Okay. So be like, don't, oh, Bridget, I can't, it's too hard. I can't figure this out. Okay. If this is happening, we can do it. All right. Okay. <laughs> you guys. All right. Um, so, um, with that, let's do another giveaway real quick. Um, what do you think, Mace? Hundred bucks to Amazon. Hundred bucks. Hundred bucks to Amazon. Amazon. You can buy anything on Amazon. Should be Amazon. Hundred dollars to Amazon. Um, type in the chat. Uh, we got this. Because I want you guys to feel like you can do a fun. Like type in we got this in the chat. I'm gonna pick somebody. Okay. Type in we got this in the chat. <laughs> Make sure you type it to everyone, not just hosts and panelists as well. Okay. Uh, five, four, three, two, one. Oh man, they're coming in so fast. I gotta grab somebody. Um. Uh, Dan Nelson, Dan Nelson, congrats. You got a hundred dollars to Amazon coming your way, brother. Send a uh, Mason or Matthew, whoever's behind the scenes right here. Um, in the chat, send him your email. Dan will send you a uh, gift card. Congrats, brother. Um, all right. Now let's, uh, let's dive in. So a bunch of people were asking questions here now. So just so you you know, we started a company called fun launch and I mentioned this earlier. We wanted to help more people launch funds. We want to help more people get in this world. And essentially what my, I felt like I wanted to give people access to what I had access to. I had an incredible dad and an incredible brother that taught me about funds. And that's very unusual. And I understand the uniqueness of my position. 
Um, if you go on YouTube or if you try to learn, like learn this online, it's, it's super complex. There's nothing really written about it. And the, I mean, the real reason we started fun launch live and fun launch and everything was to help regular people like me and you go out and launch funds. So, uh, what I've done for you guys is this. Okay. Um, again, you can't buy anything, any, any on this call today, but we actually help people a lot with funds. We help them figure out where their fund is, how to put business in it. And if, if you want help from my team directly, we can help you with that. If you want to just learn, we got free courses. We got just like free videos, free content. We just want to educate the world on funds. Now, how this works is um, I've actually got a team of people over here. They're actually sitting right outside my office. We got five guys that are trained by me on funds. So if you're curious about like, could this work for my fund? Could I like launch a fund like this? These guys are trained by me. They will help you figure out if this could work for you. And if we could help you, and if we can't help you, I'll refer you to somebody else. But we have lawyers that can come in. We have pitch deck designers. We have all the, like, we have everything. We've launched, like I said before, 120 funds in the last year through our group. So what I'm going to do, my guys have blocked out some time in their call for today. They've, I think they've got 14 or 15 time slots open, okay? If you guys want to talk to somebody on my team, I'm going to put the offer open for literally one minute. You have one minute to book a call, and then we're going to keep going. I'm going to talk about... Uh, the fund launch formula, how we're going to launch funds, all that kind of stuff. We're going to go to the crazy zone about how funds are built. Sound good? But we, my guys, have, it's, it's for today or tomorrow. They've opened up time slots. So again, it's first come, first serve. Um, here you guys go, okay? Um, you can go book a call right there. Mason's going to drop a link in the chat um, as well. You guys can go book a call here if you want. And then we're going to talk about in just a second, we have literally one minute. I'm going to answer a few questions here. And then we're going to talk about how this is structured on a 10 plus billion dollar fund. We're actually going to walk through the fund launch formula, how that kind of works. But again, if you guys are curious about how funds worked, how they're put together. You've got one minute. I won't move without you. So go on there, funlaunch.com slash call. It's first come first. We only have 15 time slots open. So go grab one right now. Um, and once they're gone, they're gone. Okay. Um, these guys are busy. They're trained by me. They have busy schedules, but I, I asked them to book off some time just for people that were live today on this call that you guys could book something. Does that sound fair? My little gift to you guys, if, if you want to learn about funds. Um, and we have Fun Launch Live. We have the Fun Launch Academy. We have Blacker Coaching Group. And again, if we can't help you, we will refer you to somebody else that can help you. Again, my goal is to help more people understand this game of funds, how funds are how funds are working, all that kind of stuff. Sound good? Um, questions? Yeah. Do we help people international? 100%. We have people in. We actually have people in Canada, in the UK, in Australia, in the Middle East. We help you have. We have funds all over the world. We help people with. So yes, we help people all over the world. Um, some of you guys that are in different locations. Um, we do live events. We actually have an event coming up soon with you guys can come out and hang out with me, all the black card members, everything else. We can come and hang out, be in person. I like doing stuff in person. So I just, cause I get more done. I just feel like I'm, I love being immersed. I feel like proximity is power. If I can get to something close, like if I can taste it, I can, I can touch it. I can feel it. Like I accomplish that thing quicker. And so that's why I, we like throwing live events. We do stuff in person. You can come shake someone's hand, look somebody in the eyeballs and like, so it's fun. So you guys can come to our next event, all that kind of stuff. So just ask them on the phone. You can bring that up on the call, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Sound good. All right. Timer's down. Let's go on to the next thing. So um, I'll tell a quick story. Okay. And this will kind of highlight the next piece we're going to talk about. So I uh, take, take you back a couple of years. I launched my second fund. So we were running this fund. And again, I'm 24 years old at the time. I got invited um, to go to this kind of secret business meeting in this really nice boardroom office area. So I go in, um, there's three gentlemen meeting and I was invited as the fourth. Okay. Um, so I got invited in. I got invited by one of the guys and I won't say their names because you might know who they are. They are pretty prominent figures on social media, online, across the board. So I won't say their names, but I got invited. The two guys that were already there did not want me to show up. And by the way, they were discussing a brand new fund that they were going to launch. So two guys there, uh, it was pretty obvious they didn't want me to be there. The one guy that invited me was a friend of mine and he wanted me to show up. So they're talking this new fund that they are going to build. So I show up to this boardroom, I walk in, we sit down. And it's pretty blatant that they uh, kind of leaving me out of the conversation. And I'm 24 years old. These guys are mid forties, early fifties. I mean, they're twice my age and these are successful. I mean, very successful business people. They got all the cars and the jets and everything. Okay. So I'm sitting there. I'm kind of sheepish. I'm just sitting in my little seat, just kind of sitting there. And they're talking about their fund that they're going to build without me. Right. And so I just have this moment of courage. And you, you know what I'm talking about? Like that, just this moment of like, you know what? Screw it. Like, I'm going to just send it. And so I kind of raised my hand in this meeting. I'm like, hey, real quick. Um, as you guys are talking about your fund, like, what are you guys going to do for pref, your catch-up carried interest? Are you guys going to run an American or European waterfall? Are you guys going to do uh, management fees? Are you going to have an investment advisor, a registered investment advisor? Like, what are you guys going to do? 
and they kind of all go quiet. And like, what do you mean? I'm like, oh yeah, well, how are you going to structure it? Like, what are you going to do for all like, you know, you carried interest or your American waterfall? Like, what are you going to do? And they're like, go to the whiteboard, go, go, go explain it to us. Like, what do you mean? So I went up to the whiteboard and over the next seven minutes, I described, I'm actually going to describe to you what I taught them piece of it. And I described it to them on the whiteboard within seven to eight minutes. They were very impressed. They wanted me to be a full business partner with them in their new business, in their new fund, 25, 25, 25, 25. I went from zero, nothing worthless dirt to a full equal partner with them in this fund because of the stuff I'm about to describe to you right now. Does that sound good? Okay. So if you guys want to pull out a pen and paper, take some notes, we're going to dive into it. Sound good? Type a yes in the chat if you guys are ready to get going. Sound good? Okay. Let's dive into it. So we're going to talk about um, kind of simple and we're going to go pretty advanced. And if it goes over your head, no worries about it. You guys can come. I think that we might send out a recording or something like this. I don't know. You guys can go watch it again or just take notes or whatever. Okay. On the screen, we've got a timeline of return. So on the left, we've got 0% IRR. IRR stands for internal rate of return. Or you can just say returns for this example. Just use returns. So you got 0%. We got a 10% return, a 20% return on the screen. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk through how returns work in the fund. Sound good? So right here, a lot of funds will charge a 2% management fee. So 2% management fee off the top. This is before the other returns are calculated. Okay. So 2% management fees off the top. And by the way, um, these are terms that you can use when you go to a dinner party, you're at an interview, when you're in a business meeting, you're going to want to recall these things because you're going to sound super smart and sophisticated and maybe get on a business deal that you didn't know before. Sound good? Okay. The next thing that a lot of funds do is do what's called a PREF or a preferential rate of return. So for example, in a lot of funds that I see, my first original fund was an 8% PREF, meaning the first 8% of all returns go to my investors or limited partners. Okay. So first 8% of any return I get goes right to my investors. Um, if, if this year we got a 7% return, all 7% would go to you, okay? After fees. Above there, we do what's called a catch-up. Now, again, if, while I'm going, by the way, the top is what we get, me and you, the fund manager. The bottom is what the investors get, okay? So the top, the catch-up, 2%. So again, if, if we got a 10% return this year, and don't think about that, this is after management fees, but the first 8% would go to the investors. Next 2% would come to the general part of the ninth and 10th percentile. Does that sound good? Above 10% IRR, we split, let's just say for this example, we got a 22% return. We do an 80-20 split. So 80% goes to the investor, 20% to us, the fund manager, the general partner, okay? So, and this is after fees again. So let's say, for example, we got a 22% return this year after fees. First 8% goes to the investors. Next 2% comes to me and you, the general partner, the fund managers. The next... Uh, this then is split 80, 20. So nine, so this is 12 percentiles, 9.8 or 80% would go to the investors and 2.2 would come to us at the top as the fund manager. Is that kind of making sense? Is this following along so far? So if you total those together, if you total two plus two plus 2.2, that's 6.2%. If you total the bottom, that's 17.8% return to investors. Okay. Um, and again, the, you might add these up. It's 2% more because if this is after fees. So after, so we really would have got a 24% return for the year, but a, a, a management fee is 2%, okay? Is that kind of making sense so far? You follow along? Now, by the way, this is good to note. Even if you don't ever run a fund, you're probably going to get pitched on funds in the future. This is a great question to ask somebody. Hey, okay, you're pitching, you're, you're going to average a 22 IRR, correct? Oh yeah, we're getting 22 this year. That's the plan. What's my take home to me as the investor? Because the fund got a 22, but I only took home 17.8 as the investor. Interesting, right? It's a different number. So whenever I'm getting pitched a fund, I always ask like, okay, give me the cash on cash. Like what's the net return to me? Not IRR. And by the way, IRRs can be manipulated by the risk-free rate. Like what is the risk-free rate? How is it one? Is it five? Like what's the risk-free rate? Anyways, what is, it's just a little tip. If you're getting pitched a fund, ask them what's the cash, like net return to me as the fund manager or as the, as the investor. Is that good? Is that helpful? Okay, so let me give you a few examples. Let's make a little more sense. Okay, just stay with me. So this is a case. This is actually my fund, Blackbridge Holdings. This is how we did this. Um, okay, I did not do a management fee. I said, hey, investors, I'm not taking any management fee. I don't make money unless you make at least eight percent first. So again, this is an old fund of mine. But if you if you invest in that fund, 
if we made a 7% this year, all 7% would go to you. I wouldn't make a dollar. I don't make anything unless we get 8% first. Okay. And then above 8%, again, we go 2% here. We then go 80, 20 split. Now, what I did is I tweak some things. And, and what's cool about funds is you get to write the Bible. We're going to talk about this in a minute, but you get to just, you can pick all these. You can decide these. Some funds do a 7% pref. Some funds do 70, 30 split. Some funds charge a 3% management fee. You decide, which is so cool. Okay. So in my fund, I said, we're going to do, see that little shift there? We're going to do an 80, 20 split until a 20 IRR. Okay. And then if we get a 20 IRR, if we get above that, we'll start splitting 50, 50. Okay. So again, first 8% to the investors next two to me, 80, 20 until 20, 20 IRR. And then we'll split 50, 50. So if you remember, what was my first return on my fund? You remember 64% return kind of crazy, right? So I got, we did 8% to eight. And then from 20% IRR to 64, we split 50, 50 with my investors. Kind of interesting, right? Okay. You can kind of do the math. Now, you might be sitting there back to like kind of this number. Um, let me go here. Like, okay, Bridger, I'm not, you know, I made, let's just say on this example, I made 6.2% goes to fund managers. That's like, that's nothing. I don't want to make 6.2%. No, yes, you do. Okay. Because that's not 6.2% on your own money. That's 6.2% on the entire fund. So if you manage and funds are just scale, but it's a linear thing. So if you have a $10 million fund, 6.2% is $620,000. If you run a hundred million dollar fund, that's 6.2 million dollars in one year. If you run a billion dollar fund, which you see online, a billion dollar fund here, a billion dollar fund there, billion dollar fund, that's $62 million in one year. That's a million dollars a week that you're making. If you run a $10 billion fund, that's $620 million dollars in one year. That's 10 million a week that you're making from your fund. It's pretty crazy. Remember that side at the beginning, those fund managers, they run 80 to $200 billion funds. And that's how they make one to $3 billion a year net just to them. And typically a lot of funds, you don't need a lot of employees to run a fund that all, a lot of it comes back to you, which is so cool. You guys, you guys starting to get this? It's like, why funds again are the most lucrative vehicle on planet earth. Is that kind of making sense? Okay. So um, now is this helpful? Is this helping along? So I want to share with you guys the structure of funds. So you know, the right terminology. So remember when I, I talked about this earlier, right? We had investors, we had us and assets, same exact structure, just different names. So I'm going to give you the actual terminology of names. This is how 99% of all private funds in the world are structured. Okay. Instead of a pool of money, it's called, you see my little pool here. It's called a limited partnership or your fund. Okay. So in, instead of writing pool, you just call it a limited partnership. Instead of saying like us in fund managers, that's called the general partner. Okay. So the general partner is the fund manager of the limited partnership or the fund. You guys follow along. So take some notes on this. This, this, this helps. You have your Avenger team, or this is like your dream team over here. This is your, you know, people. And then you have investors just like before, right? Same thing. Investors put money in the pool. Us, we buy assets. Just as before, we have investors that are called different name, limited partners of the fund. So they invest money into the fund and the general partner manages the fund. So if you think about a limit, uh, you have a limited partnership, limited partners invest into the limited partnership that is governed by the general partner. Okay, the general partner governs the limited partnership that has investors that are called limited partners. Is this kind of making sense? Just same thing, but just different terminology. So you'll hear... And like, you'll start hearing it. If you haven't heard it before, you start hearing it. Hey, they run a GPLP structure. That stands for general partner, limited partnership structure. Okay. Um, or my, you'll hear this, like my LPs, my limited partners. These are my LPs. Okay. Is that kind of making sense? That's what they mean is investors. Okay. And they go buy assets. Whenever those assets make money, it flows back to the limited partnership and gets split between the investors and the general partner. Like we talked about before, the 8% pref, 20% carry. That's what they're talking about here. Not, not that crazy, right? It's pretty simple. Now, uh, funds are governed by two main documents. And this is the, they, we call them, I like to call them the Bible, okay? These main documents, they are thick. These are long legal documents, okay? They are a hundred pages each and uh, they're very expensive. And these are the Bible. You, the coolest thing about a fund is you get to write the Bible. 
you get to decide the laws, the bylaws, everything that goes on in the Bible. So you can write in, like we said before, hey, we want to do a 3% management fee. Okay, you write that in your Bible. Um, minimum commitment for our fund is $100,000. You write that in your Bible. But the cool thing about funds is you get to write the Bible. Now, once the Bible is written, the LPM, PPM, you've got to stick to it though. You can't go back and change it. You got to stick to the Bible. So if your fund, like my fund is a crypto fund, we buy and sell cryptocurrencies. Even if, if we get the best real estate deal on planet earth, my fund can't buy it because in my LPM, PPM, it says I cannot buy real estate. Even if I get the best NFT project on planet earth, my fund says we're only going to buy cryptocurrency coins. I can't buy NFTs. Now I can launch a new fund and raise new capital and go buy NFTs with a new LPM PPM, but I can't, I can't break my covenants and laws. Is that kind of making sense? Is this helpful so far? Um, and then additionally, some funds have an investment advisor over here as well that collects the management fees, but we can talk about it more in, in the Q and A section. Sound good? Now you guys want to go to the crazy zone. You want to see how this works for a $10 billion fund. We've actually helped a number of these funds structure and are put together. Does that sound good? Okay. You guys want to so far? Stand up for a second, stretch you out. Should we do another giveaway? One more giveaway before we go to the crazy zone here. Why not? Let's give a hundred dollars away. Um, ooh, all right. Uh, in the chat, let's and type in the chat. Uh, just type in yes. Type yes to the chat. Or yeah, type just yes. Go yes. Okay, five, four, three, and stand up, stretch out for a second. You know, get some, get a little loosey goosey. Three, two, one. Uh, Chris Lopez. Okay, Chris Lopez, you got a hundred dollars coming your way. I'm taking off my jacket here. We're going to the crazy zone, people. You guys ready? And by the way, I'm going to share this and we, we'll pull up Q&A. We'll pull up the whiteboard here in a minute. Sound good? All right, let's talk about how crazy big funds are structured. This is what's, if you ever heard parallel funds, feeder funds, Luxembourg funds, Cayman Island funds, that we're going to talk about right now. Okay, let's dive into it. So again, you have the same. And if this goes over your head, don't worry about it. You're good. We'll hit the next section. Okay, this is how uh, we go to the crazy zones. We've got our investment advisor, general partner. This member, we just talked about the same things, right? These two boxes are at the top here. Instead of one limited partnership, a lot of these big funds will set up three limited partnerships. And they're called parallel funds. Okay, again, we're going to the crazy zone. If it's over your head, don't worry about it. These are for different types of investors. So you have accredited investors, uh, qualified clients, qualified purchasers. And then these are for international investors over here, this master LP. Um, so a lot of you guys have heard of accredited investors, right? Um, there's also two tiers higher than accredited investor. You have a qualified client, and you have a qualified purchaser. Um, a credit investor makes um, has a million dollar net worth, excluding their home. They make $200,000 a year or $300,000 a year with a spouse. If you do one of those things, and there's a bunch of other things, you can take a test and stuff now, but you become an accredited investor and you're allowed to, and the SEC actually, it's an SEC rule. It's an SEC rule that sometimes you can't invest in certain things unless you're an accredited investor. Above that, you have a qualified client. Qualified clients have a $2.2 .2 million net worth, excluding their home. Qualified purchasers have a $5 million net worth, excluding their home. And again, there's a few other nuances. I'm going quick here, but that's kind of the, the categories of investors. Okay. So they, they raise capital for different investors. And let's say just, for example, let's say this first circle raises a hundred million dollars. This middle circle raises $200 million. And this circle raises $300 million. Okay. So for a total of a $600 million fund, they have an LPM, PPM, a Bible, all those, that money, they flow that money down to a holding company pro rata how much money they have. That holding company then goes and buys, let's say, for example, real estate. They will set up special purpose entities and go buy real estate. So this, this box would represent like a skyscraper in Dallas. This box would represent a, an apartment complex in Chicago. This would be an apartment complex in, in Indiana, okay? These are all different properties. When those properties make money, it flows back to the holding company and then flows back to each fund here. And that fund splits the money between the general partner and their individual investors. Is that kind of making sense? Follow along so far? Again, we're in the crazy zone. We're going crazy. All right, let's now talk about uh, feeder funds or, or international investors. So let's say you go out and you found a ton of investors out of South Korea, okay? And these investors, you could have them invest directly into like the qualified purchaser fund. However, if they do that, every year, those Korean investors have to file U.S. tax returns. They've got to hire a translator. They've got to hire somebody out of the U.S. And it's a big hassle to file U.S. tax returns. Like you don't want to do that. So what they do is they do this. And this is, again, this is an example, not taxes. I'm giving you an example of how it may work. Those Korean investors, let's say there's 15 of them up here. 
they all invest into the a Cayman Islands feeder fund. The Cayman Islands feeder fund takes 15 investors, consolidates it down to one, and then that Cayman Islands fund invests once into the master LP, okay? At the end of the year, taxes come out. The master LP sends one tax return to the Cayman Islands fund. The Cayman Islands fund pays the tax. So there's no like tax avoidance. The same amount of tax is being paid, but the Cayman Islands is a, is a pass-through tax-free uh, holding uh, entity. And then it passes through all the money and returns just back to the investors. They don't have to file U.S. tax returns. They, they still get, the money gets collected, but they don't have to spend the time or effort filing U.S. tax returns. So for example, um, if you made $100 here and they pay 20%, so 80, 80 you know, so $20 is paid, they end up with $80 here. And out of these other funds, the investors would make $100, but then pay $20 in tax. They end up with $80 total. Does that make sense? Same dollar amount of taxes paid, but it makes it very easy. So for example, in Europe, um, Europe outlawed Cayman Island funds. But what did they set up? They set up Luxembourg funds. It's the same process. You just invest them through the Luxembourg and then you invest in the United States. There's uh, Alberta, Canada funds. There's Ireland funds. There are Dubai funds that are all, all the same purpose of doing a, a pass-through entity to taxes, okay? Now, there are also illegal ways to run Cayman Island funds. Like every movie you ever see, it's like an illegal Cayman Islands fund. This is the legal way to run Cayman Island funds, okay? <laughs> there are also illegal ways to like money launder and stuff. This is the legal way to do it, okay? Um, additionally, you might get one large investor um, and sometimes you set up a, a full special managed account just for that investor. They're going to give you $200 million from some Dubai prince. You set up a special fund just for them that are separated and they invest into the holding company here. Okay. If that went over your head, no worries. We can talk about the Q&A, but kind of cool, right? Isn't that kind of sick um, to kind of see this is how like multi-billion dollar funds are structured on the back end, kind of an example of how they do it. Isn't that kind of cool? Okay. Isn't that going to give you like a little like heads up of how things work? So now- um, we haven't talked a ton about fun. Actually, we did a little bit about fun last slide, which is kind of cool. Um, I want to show you guys a video real quick. And then actually we're gonna talk about the fun launch formula in a second, but you guys want to see this video fun launch slide, take a little break, relax, grab a drink real quick. And we're going to dive into the fun launch formula. Actually how people, we help people launch funds through a four step formula. This is how entrepreneurs launch funds. But real quick, I want to show you this video. I got to take a drink. We are the crazy 1% who believes they can change the world. The crazy 1% who stop at nothing. And what's crazy enough about the crazy 1% is they're actually the ones who change the world. I wanted to have like, regular people or people like you guys have access to the same thing that I had access to. I mean, it's just like what Tony Robbins says, proximity is power. This event is insane. The quality of person that you'll meet at Fun Launch Live is second to none. Okay. Fun launch live people. Um, there it is. If you guys haven't got tickets yet, uh, I would highly recommend we sold out early. We actually are ahead of schedule right now selling out, which is crazy. We've sold a lot of tickets, um, May 10th through the 12th, man. Convention center. Now I want to do something cool for you guys. Okay. On this call. Um, I already showed you the renders, right? For fun launch live 2023. Um, this is the cool renders. We got the curved led screen, everything here. So we got fun launch live tickets here. Now I mentioned this before we started fun launch. We hope you will launch funds, right? And then, and we opened up calls a minute ago. I just talked to Mason actually while we I muted while we were watching that video. Um, so we had a ton of people book calls. We actually filled up all the call spots. People want to launch funds. We just talked to our team. They're all here. They actually are willing to work on Saturday. They said, we'll open up some calls for Saturday and over the weekend and maybe early next week as well. Cause there's a lot of people on here that couldn't, but they were messaging us that couldn't book a call. So if you guys want to book a call, we're going to do one more minute. You guys can book a call here. Um, additionally, we're gonna do a little bonus as well. If you guys, uh, join and book a call. You'll be able to come to our next event. Um, we've got Fun Launch Live coming up for discounted ticket prices. So bring that up on the call. We're going to do a huge discount. Um, I think it's like 50% off. If you guys join Black Card or one of our other groups, if you join Black Card, you get 50% off tickets and all that kind of stuff. So bring that up on the call with them. I'm um, going to guys do this. So we open up calls for the weekend. We got one minute. We are live here. And then we're going to talk about the Fun Launch formula. So again, if you guys if you guys couldn't book a call or the times were weird, Go book a call. They open up, these guys open up time for their, over the weekend and over next week as well. You guys can go book calls um, and grab spots. They were very generous to do that, which is awesome. 
we had a lot of people on this call that wanted to just wanted to hop on a call. So again, we will help you in any, any stage. If you're a brand new beginner, if you're already having an existing fund, we will figure out a spot to help you. And if, and again, if we can't help you, we will refer you to somebody else. We're going to find a, a spot for you. If you want to come to our events, we have awesome courses. We have actually a group. We have a, like, if you want to work with me and our team, we have 15 different coaches all around the world. So we have two coaches in Canada, a coach in Europe. Um, we have coaches in the United States that come and specialize in different things that will help you think through your fund. We've actually partnered with some funds as well. Um, so just bring that up on the call and you guys can get 50% off tickets to Fund Launch Live as well when you join Black Cards. It's so freaking cool, okay? There's the there's the link. I'll give you guys got 10 more seconds. So go quick. <laughs> and then we're going to pull the whiteboard actually. And uh, we're going to dive into some other stuff. Sound good? Um, there's a timer, three, two, one. Any questions real quick I, just on this, on the book calls or if things not working for you, by the way, um, we've had a few people, if we've had a lot of people book calls at the same time, if you click on the link and some, like sometimes the software is a little slow, if somebody else clicks the same time as you, it might kick you out of that time. So just, just if you're aware, if it kicks you out, go back in and just try another time slot. And sorry, we just, we sometimes get overloaded. We have a lot of people on here. <laughs> last week we had a, like, we had a few people last week that were like, I can't book. And their times are getting taken. We had so many people taking time. So again, it's, it is first come first serve. So you got to be quick on the, quick on the keys. All right. So, <laughs> um, all right. So grab that link. Mason will drop it in one more time, but now I'm actually going to pull up the whiteboard here and let's talk a uh, fun launch formula. Sound good. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And let's, uh, I'm going to pull up the whiteboard here and share with you guys. Um, and again, you guys, I'll give you like 30 more seconds. If you guys are booking calls or whatever, don't worry. You're not going to miss anything. Um, but here we go. Let me know if you can see the screen, type them in the chat. If you guys can see my screen or not. Um, let's pull this open. Boom. Can you guys see it yet? Is it working? Not yet. What's going on? Fun. Can you like replug that in for me, Mason, that white cord? Yeah, just that one. Plug it out and plug it back in. Let's try it one more time. Hey, I'm I'm live with you guys. I'm here, baby. There we go. Oh, hey, there we go. Can you see that now? Is that working? Mason. Clap it up for Mason Brains, everybody. <laughs> Got it worked. My heart dropped. I was like, oh no, the white, I love the whiteboard. Okay. So we're gonna talk about um fund launch formula. This is the easiest, fastest, most efficient way to launch fund. So it's funny enough. So we launched fund launch, right? And I want, I like, I like talking to fund managers, I like hearing what they're doing. So we started a podcast and at their show, we started to interview fund managers. We have um, huge fund managers that come speak at our events. We have guys that run billion dollar funds coming to speak and they come in our podcast, all that kind of stuff. And it was funny enough. I started to see a pattern because I'd ask them, how'd you start your fund? And they would tell me the story. And I saw this pattern of how these funds were launched. And then I matched up and it's like, it's actually the same pattern that I launched my funds with. And so then when we finally coined it, we're like, you know what, let's just put this together in a step-by-step -step process. And we coined the phrase fund launch formula. And so this is again, a four-step formula for people like us. Aren't, we aren't the, you know, the Harvard grads. We aren't the people with the Vanderbilt family that has a gazillion dollars to spend and just throw away money. We are efficient with our capital. This is how effective funds run and are put together, all that kind of stuff. Okay. That's what I'm going to talk about. And it's pretty, it's a pretty efficient way to launch funds. Now, if you go online, I actually did this on a video. We had, we went online, we actually Googled how to launch a fund. And there's all these blogs that pop up and they, you can tell the people writing these blogs have never launched a fund before. Most people will tell you, step number one, go hire lawyers. Lawyers are like 30 to $50,000 to launch a fund. So you go pay, let's say 40, $50,000 to launch a fund. Um, you build the legal documents. You then take those legal documents. You then build a pitch deck. You then go pitch investors. And then you hope those investors put money in. And if they don't put money in, well, shoot, you're out $50,000. That is like though, that's actually the opposite way that we, the, these steps, like almost the opposite way that we teach how to do funds. Okay. So I want to teach you guys the lean, efficient, like effective way to launch funds. Sound good. If you're ready, type yes in the chat. If you guys are ready to get going. Sound good. Okay. Let's talk about it. So step number one, we're going to go through here. Um, it's funny enough. So I, uh, to kind of preface this, I, um, was with my dad and I was, so back to my story, I was with my dad. I was, I was like, dad, how am I going to raise money? Cause he wasn't going to invest my deals. So go raise my I'm like, how am I gonna do this? No one will believe me. I don't have a track record. I didn't go to, I didn't graduate college. I didn't have like any of this stuff. Who will invest me? He goes, Bridger, I want to give you an example. And again, this is an example, but go with me. Okay. He goes, imagine me and you found, especially right now in 2023, we're going to talk about economic conditions in like five or 10 minutes. But right now, there's a lot of people that are stressed or maybe over leveraged. Let's say we find this lady. She's in um, 
Billings, Montana. She has a Lamborghini, a Ventador, and uh, she needs to sell it quickly. And she's like, hey, this by this Saturday, I've got to sell this car and I'll sell it for $50,000. I just need, I need cash. They're going to foreclose my house. I need money right now. I need to sell this car. Anybody have 50 grand, you can buy the car for me. Okay. And my dad, he's telling me, he's like, in 2007, 2008, this happened. You could do this for real. Okay. So he goes, Bridger, let's say we found a, we have this car and we have a mechanic look at it. This car is legit. It's not like fake or, you know, it's not like whatever. It's legit. And we believe we can turn around and sell that car for $250,000 on Monday morning. Should still be a good deal for a Lamborghini Aventador. Okay. He goes, Bridger. And again, this example, go with me. And I'm going to ask you guys the same question. Could you find, you can't use any of your own money. Could you go find $50,000 by Saturday morning? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, no, could you find 50 grand? We're going to buy this car together and we will turn around and sell it for 250. We'll make a $200,000 spread in like four days. And yeah, you got to pay back your investor and stuff, but you'll make a good chunk of that. Could you find 50 grand? And I sat down, I was like, man, and I'm in college at the time. I was like, you know what? I might have to stay up all night. I'll fly around. I'll, I'm, I'm like, I'll go knock on doors. I'm going to make a hundred maybe a hundred grand or 150 grand over the weekend. I was like, you know what? Yeah. I could talk to business owners. I could knock on doors, college professors, an aunt and uncle, a rich grandpa, somebody in my family, like anybody. I was like, you know what? You know, if the deal was that good, it was guaranteed. It was checked out. Like, you know what? Yeah, I could find 50 grand. Like I'm going to make a hundred. Let's say we split at 50, 50 dollar investor. I'm going to make a hundred grand this weekend. Like dang straight, dude, I'm doing this. Like I'm a hustler. You know what I'm talking about? Like that mentality. I was like, I'm doing this. He's like, cool. And anybody any in the chat, you guys think you could find 50 grand by Saturday to do this deal? If it was at all checked out, you were going to flip this car for that much. So he goes, okay, cool, Bridger. What if, um, what if the car was a hundred thousand dollars? And I was like, oh man. So again, a hundred grand, I'll, we're going to flip it. We'll make a $150,000 spread once we sell it again. And we'll split that with them. Maybe we split it 50, 50 with our investors. I'll take home 75 grand. And I was like, dude, I'm going to make 75 grand on the weekend. I bet you it might be hard. I might struggle a little bit, but I bet I could find you a hundred grand. And he goes, why? And I said, well, dude, the example you gave me, the deal was so good. Like it was so, it's such a juicy deal. Like it's a, it's a no brainer. He goes, aha, there it is. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he goes, three minutes ago, you were telling me you're inexperienced. You don't have a college degree. You don't have anything. But all of a sudden you believe that you could find a hundred thousand dollars by Saturday morning. Why? Because the deal was so good. And he goes, the easiest way to launch a fund, step number one of a fund is find an incredible deal. Now by deal, I'm gonna put this in quotes. It could literally be, we have actually guys in our group that do flip, they flip cars for their fund, which is pretty cool. This could be finding a real estate deal. It could be a strategy of how you trade options on the market or Forex, right? But you find this incredible deal and you vet this deal out. You do all your due diligence. You go in, you find an incredible deal. It's the easiest way to cut through all the noise of the next steps. Is, that, is this kind of making sense so far? Type a yes in the chat. That's kind of making sense, okay? Find incredible deal. And by the way, in 2023, we're gonna talk about it in just a minute. Deals are here. Deals are happening right now. People are over leveraged. They need to dump properties and they're, they're going through crazy stuff. And you can come in and scoop up things for pennies on the dollar, which is so cool. Okay. So now you found a great deal. What's the next step? Most people at this point, okay, Bridger. Okay. Let's hire the lawyers. Let's get stuff going. Let's, let's get the lawyers going. And I go, eh, hold on. But before you go hire lawyers, actually lawyers is step number four. Okay. Before you go hire lawyers, go to step number two. This is what I call the frame. Step number two, you go frame out your entire fund. What we talked about earlier, are you going to charge a management fee, a pref, a catch-up, carried interest? How are you going to structure your fund? How are you going to put it together? How's it going to run? Okay. You can do that. The crazy um, international feeder structures. How are you going to put this together? And you boil it down all the way to a PowerPoint presentation. You then take that PowerPoint presentation. You go to step number three and you go and actually pitch investors. But wait, Bridger, hold on. I don't, I don't have legal documents done. How do I pitch investor without legal documents? This is how you do it. You go talk to an investor. Hey, uh, Miss, you know, Mrs. Johnson. Hey, uh, you know, we've been friends for a while, whatever. I want to actually talk to you about something if you, or whatever it is. If they're a mentor, what I actually do is this. I can say, hey, I've got an idea for fun. I know Miss Johnson, you get pitched by everybody. Can you actually be like, if you give me 12 minutes, I want to practice pitching on you and just see if this is a good idea or not. Are you okay? Like, are you okay to give up 12 minutes? We'll hop on Zoom. I, I promise I'll be quick, but you look at so many deals. You're so good at looking at deals. Just let me know if I'm on the right track or not. 
And a lot of times, like, you know what? This guy's a young hustler. You know what? I'll give him 12 minutes. So I hop on, I pitch Mrs. Johnson on my entire fund, my prep, my catch up, my deal. And Miss Johnson, Mrs. Johnson might give me some good feedback. And maybe I might have to go back and reframe some stuff. Maybe I change my management fee or maybe I relook at the deal and I restart and then I circle back. Now, if she loves it, she's like, actually, this is a really good deal. I say, you know what? We're actually going to do this. If we put this all together, get the lawyers done, could I put you down for like a verbal commitment for uh, $50,000 or $100,000? If everything checked out, she goes, you know, yeah, if everything checks out, put me down for a verbal commitment. So what I do is I go get verbal commitments. Aha, kind of cool, right? So in our group, by the way, we help people do this. So when you join Black or whatever, we help people go. Step one, we help you find your deal. We vet it out. Our coaches come in and vet out your prep, your clutch up. We actually practice pitching with you. And then our goal for everyone in our group, we try to get you two to $3 million of verbal commitments. And then, and only then you go to your lawyers and then you, and then you keep iterating. You go back, you do this little loop. And then when you're ready, you go to step four, you pay the money for the lawyers. And by the way, that's a reimbursable expense back to you. So let's say lawyers are 30 grand. We actually get it for a lot cheaper because, um, but most lawyers are 30 grand. Whenever I walk into a lawyer's office, most people walk into a lawyer's office is what they do. They go, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this deal. What's your thoughts on it? And they, lawyers will love to teach you. They'll love, they talk slow and they're methodical and they will bill you $800 an hour to teach you about like all the stuff I've taught you in the last hour, hour and a half. They'll bill you $800 an hour to teach you very slow and methodically. And then you go build your fund and then an investor wants to change something. So you go back and then, oh yeah, I'll, I'll happily change that for you. Let's bill you by the hour. And that's why most funds are 30 to 50. Even I had a guy, he spent $120,000 on his fund, just documents. He kept changing, going back and forth. When I walk into a lawyer's office, I walk in and I say, hey, I want X, Y, Z with a drink and a side of fries. It's exactly what I want. Okay. And so, and they're like, great. And I'm like, you bill by the hour. Cool. My last fund I set up for myself was like, I don't know, 10 grand maybe. Because I save my lawyers a lot of time, which saves me a lot of money. Cause I know what I'm doing. Right. I educate myself first on the fund. I practice. I know the commitments. I know what I want because most funds do this. And actually sometimes you go to, you go to, you get to step three. I've done this on, I think three fund ideas. I got to step three pitched investors and they hated it. And they just didn't. And then the deal wasn't that. And I was like, oh yeah, it's kind of, that's kind of dumb. <laughs> and I'll be frank with you. I, I've done this. I'm so happy. I didn't pay lawyers 30 grand because I got to step three and I found out it wasn't a good fund idea. So I said, okay, great. Let me go back to the drawing board. And let me find a new deal. All I wasted was a little bit of time. I didn't waste money back and forth with lawyers. Is that kind of making sense? This is the fun. The fun launch formula is amazing for this. Okay. And he like, aha, it's like, that's, that's, and guys, it's not that crazy. Again, I try to make things, that's a pretty complex thing, launching a fund down to four pretty simple steps. So we help you with your frame. Like this is actually a big piece, right? Your frame, your deal, you're getting commitments. And then finally the lawyers, we actually, we have lawyers in our team that come in and can build the fund for you, all that kind of stuff, which is kind of cool. Okay. Is that helpful? Is that helpful so far? Is this kind of making sense? Any questions actually, questions on this before I move on, before I get the whiteboard out. Uh, Mason, do you see any on here? I thought I should, you can help me look through. We got a lot of people on here live. Any questions here? Um, feeling good? So again, this can work for, um, you know, funds. And by the, and also, sorry, let me clarify what I do. Again, I go to my, I go to step four. I get my lawyers, my legal, I get my PPM and my LPA set up. And then I go back to, I got to go back and raise capital and they got to sign the documents. So I then go back to step three. And sometimes I make a little bit of iterations, but I hope to not do that. But then I go back to the step three and get these guys to not be verbal, but then they become hard commitments is what they're called. So they become hard commitments. They sign in the fund and then I can go launch the fund, do the deals, all that kind of stuff. Kind of cool, right? I interviewed so many fund managers that were startup entrepreneur fund managers. They follow this formula exactly. So we finally coined it in the fund launch formula. People worry about it, but just get one soft. Yep. Yeah, so that, so I will then, yeah, this is like I said, I come back with my documents. I say, okay, Mrs. Johnson, remember like three weeks ago or a month ago when I talked about that deal, we're actually doing it. Um, we got the documents. I'd love to walk through them with you. The deal is actually awesome. It's actually, we got this other stuff we're putting together and it's really cool. You kind of have to repitch them a little bit because they maybe they maybe might have forgotten earlier. Then you come back in. Hey, let's get you, let's get you signed here. Cool. And then now they're officially signed into the fund. Yeah. Kind of cool, right? Um, okay, let's go back here. Other questions while we're on the on the topic. 
yeah, and no, those fees are, I mean, 30 grand is like still a good deal on a fund. Uh, people are talking about fees. My brother's law firm um, that he worked at prior, previous to this, their minimum fund was $250,000 just for lawyers. Pretty crazy. Most funds average like 500 to a million dollars just for the paper, just for the legal docs. Isn't that kind of crazy? Um, now, again, this can be a reimbursable expense though. Once the fund is launched, this actually, it's a startup cost of the fund. So this can get reimbursed back to you as the fund manager. It's kind of cool. Okay. Um, all right. Let's go back here. Is this helpful? Now I want to talk about 2023 and I actually want to share a bunch of the stuff going on right now, charts, all that kind of stuff. Um, now people are asking about that's launching your fund. Okay. And then there's other steps. You're gonna have to set up, you know, your bank account, set up third-party administrators, set up like all the processes. This is to launch. And then there's all the stuff like managing and running your fund. We help you with all that too, but the launching your fund all like if you can summarize it out of three steps or four steps, that's it right there. It's kind of cool. Um, all right, let me share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see that? Is that working? Mace looking good. good okay. Um, so again, oh, this video here. that's right. Oh yeah. We got some cool stuff, um, coming up. I'll go through this quick though. We got, uh, events coming up in the future here, um, with our black card group. Um, you guys can join. So we do live events all the time. I'll just skip through that so we can get the next content. But again, um, I think there's a few spots still open for phone calls. We have um, our black card events coming up here in the future. Um, we, have, we're, we, have, we, have throw, we throw three black card events a year. We have one like an exotic location, usually one in Utah and then one at Fun Launch Live as well. Um, so you guys get to come to all of those, which is pretty cool. The next one coming up is the one uh, in Utah here pretty soon, which is pretty cool. So you guys can go check that out um, and then uh, go check it out. So anyways, we have a few more calls. If you guys want to grab calls, we'll do one more one more call for calls. Just we'll, on oh, just Tuesday. So calls are booked out. This is for next week. We have calls available. So they've been like, they've already been booking out calls. Uh, if somebody drops, there may be like one or two to open up, but you can guys go check the link. But I believe it's only calls for next week. We've got a lot of people on this call that have wanted to book a call and learn about funds and learn about our black card group. They can come, you fly in, you get to meet with me and our team. We get to work with you on your fund. Um, or you just want to do a course or it's, we have free stuff. We have live events. Whatever you need, dude, we're here to help you. We want to help you with your fund. Um, oh yeah. So it's, what's, yeah, people are asking about that. So it's pretty cool. So in black card, actually black cards are our top coaching group. Um, we actually have a lot like a legal team that comes in and it's all included in your cost of black card. We have the legal team that comes and does the, the, the legal setup for you. We actually get huge discounts. So what we do, just so you're aware, we go to these law firms and third-party administrators and tax firms and audit firms. And we say, Hey, we've got a big group. If we refer clients to you, can you give us a group discount? And they're like, well, sure. So we get 10, 25, 30% off on a lot of these, either whether it's a third-party admin, whether it's an audit, a legal actually is included. We actually just included it in the black card program, which is pretty cool. Okay. So you get all those. Um, we have discounts on to Kaplan. If you guys want to get your like licenses and stuff, we have discounts there. We have partnerships with, I think four, maybe five. I think we might've just added another one. I think it's five law firms now. So if you need international fund structure, we have partnerships there. They give you uh, one of the, that one law firm gives a 50% discount. If you want to do like a crazy international structure, it's pretty wild. So they have discounts there um, over live events. We have coaching. We actually um, design your pitch deck for you in black card. So if you, uh, if you have a pitch deck that wants to get, like you have a, you want to get a beautified, make it look really pretty. Uh, we have a designer actually that comes in and designs your pitch deck for you. You actually come on and you pitch me and you pitch our other coaches, your fund, and we'll give you direct feedback on how you pitch how your decks put together so that you're polished. And once you go out to step three and raise capital, you're like, you practice 20 times pitching your fund and you're polished, you're ready to go. You have, you don't get surprised by some random question. Like for example, an investor will ask you, um, hey, what happens if you die, Bridger, on your fund? If you haven't heard that before and you don't have a, a appendix side, you're like, you're, you're like, oh crap. Like, I don't, I don't know uh, what happens if I die. We train our people like questions like that. We'll train you with questions and you go, oh, it's in my appendix. We actually have a whole closet, a key man thing, a, a change of uh, change of role. We actually dilute the whole fund. And we actually give money back to everybody. We've already got it planned out. Oh, okay, cool. A lot of investors will have 10 questions like that or 15 or 20 questions that are hard. And we actually practice those questions with you to make sure you're polished, you're ready to go. You know exactly what, not every investor will ask, but a majority of investors will ask you that you're just, you're just sharp and on the point. So you don't miss the chance. If you get a chance to talk to a huge investor, you're, you know, polished, ready to go. Your deck looks amazing. You got legal docs done. You practice with us and boom, you go out and launch a fund. That's how we've had a lot of, we have one student fund over a billion, four student funds in black. These are funds in black card. 
for over a hundred million and 54 funds between one and $50 million. It's pretty cool. And then you get to hang out and hop on a Slack channel and talk and be in a mastermind group with those fund managers. So I go in there, I'm like, yo, um, Hey, what's, what's all my Forex people seeing? We've, we're seeing all these, this trade with the U S dollar rubles, euros. What are you guys seeing? They come on and like share all their, oh yeah, we're seeing this, all these trade positions, all this cool stuff. You get to learn from a network of fund managers, which is so freaking cool. It's like my selfish reason I love Black Card is uh, I get to hang out with fund managers that are actively running funds in different areas of the country that maybe I don't know about. Hey, how's real estate going on in Florida? Oh, we've got five fund managers that do real estate in Florida. They're going to tell me exactly the ins and outs of the Florida market. I mean, that's pretty valuable to hang out with uh, a couple hundred fund managers in Black Card. It's pretty cool. So all right, I digress. Um, I think calls are getting booked. So my guys have opened up more times. They like, anyways, you guys are amazing. So congrats to me. Amazing. They keep telling me like, these guys are awesome. We want to, we want to talk to more of them. So um, they keep opening up calls. So again, last call, funlaunch.com slash call. All right. Woo. Let's talk about what this means for 2023. Does that sound good? Ooh, I got some economic data, all that kind of stuff for you guys. All right, let's dive into it. So um, looking at 2023, I pulled a lot of these from Fred. You'll see the, the charts and we're going to go kind of quick, drop questions if you have them, but I'm going to go kind of quick through this, okay? But I think it's going to paint an interesting picture of what we're seeing right now in 2023. So, um, okay, these are uh, credit cards and other revolving loans. Okay, so this is all the way back to the year 2000, all the way up to right now. You see... You know, a big, uh, this is again, credit card. Other So yeah, 2008, you then had a major spike in the amount of credit people took on here. You then had COVID. You had actually a big decline. You'll see in a second, savings rates jump. This is this. So this gray bar is going to be COVID. This gray bar will be the great financial crash. And then right now though, we're at all time highs for credit card and other revolving loans. Even with 2021, 2022, things slowing down, you have, I mean, this thing is barely even blipped. Even rates going up, people don't care apparently. Um, this is motor vehicle loans owned and securitized. This is again, only for uh, last 10 years here, pretty much just straight line. <laughs> I mean, COVID people love new cars. Uh, COVID did not slow down uh, car loans. And we are at again, all time highs on billions of dollars of car loans, which is kind of crazy with rates going up. A lot of them are on adjustable rates. So their, their payments are going up like crazy. Additionally, this is personal consumption expenditures. 10 years, pretty much a straight line. COVID dropped and went right back to that same line we were on before and actually has gone up a little bit. All-time highs, personal consumption expenditure. So the consumer spending has not dropped at all. Even with uh, recession warnings and inflation and all this stuff, personal consumptions, all-time highs. This is a pretty interesting chart. And by the way, sorry, this is too much. We're going to paint this all together in just a second, but this is consumer debt service payments as a percent of disposable income. Okay. So again, debt service, this is just the debt percentage people are paying as a percent of their disposable income. So right here, you have like 5%, 5.5, all the way up to six up here. That's the percent they're paying per year as a percent of their disposable income. Okay. Of debt service. So debt, you can kind of see a huge drop in COVID. This is a lot for moratoriums. You actually couldn't pay your debts off or they didn't, or they didn't, they didn't want you to. Now we're seeing those back again to all-time highs, especially with the interest rates going up. You have that as well. This is so interesting. Ready for this? Personal saving rates. 2.4%, the lowest it's been in a decade. Actually, it's funny enough, in COVID, they went to 30, uh, 33%, I think 34%. Highest it's been since World War II. That's how scared people were in COVID. They have dumped all that money back into the market. 2.4% lowest. This is actually the 20 year chart. I believe it's the, the lowest it's been in 20 years. Pretty wild. Okay. So you have record spending, record uh, loans for cars, record debt service. And you can see the consumer getting will. That's why a lot of people are talking about this consumer is going to get tapped out. There's only so much debt and so little savings you can have where the, there's a, a day of reckoning. So that's why a lot of people online are talking about this recession's coming, all that kind of stuff. That's what they're, they're referencing usually this, okay? So um, now, can I start a business or fund? Like, what does this mean for me right now? We're gonna talk about a few examples of how this works, okay? And I'm gonna go fast. We'll do a Q&A right after this. You guys can ask whatever questions you want. Can I start a business or fund during a downturn? I've actually done a ton of research. I'm a geek. Uh, I geek out on funds. Uh, like <laughs> the weekend comes around, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go research like, fund managers, like what they did and like how they did it. Okay. <laughs> so I actually did research on some of the largest fund managers in the world. It's pretty interesting in relation to recessions. So let me show you an example. So for example, Warren Buffett, greatest investor of all time. 
Do you guys know he started when he was 26 years old, started his first fund, raised $105,000 in 1956. And then 1961, he kind of said this was the big, his big investment that changed his whole world. They made, they made a million dollar investment into a windmill company. Okay. Pretty crazy. Now look at these dates in relation to a recession. Okay. He, uh, so you started in 1956, just two years later, he goes into recession. You think that, man, it's a bad time to be in business. Just start a brand new business. You go right into recession. He then uh, buys a company near the end of a recession. Okay. Pretty interesting, right? Now what's interesting about recessions, by the way, the entire thing becomes a recession. A lot of times you don't know you're in a recession until you're halfway through it. So for example, the, the technical definition of recession is two, um, uh, two quarters of economic decline. Now the White House has tried to change that definition. But uh, for example, like if you had um, two quarters of economic decline, you wouldn't know you were in a recession until you finished the second quarter. And then like a month later, they come out the data. So seven months in, you wouldn't even know you're in a recession until seven months have already happened. The whole thing becomes a recession. Same with a bear market. So uh, the definition of a bear market is down 20%. You don't know you're in a bear market until though you've hit like you're down 21%. And then the entire thing becomes a bear market. So we've been in actually a bear market already over a year. Because the, the, when the market started declining, it was about a year ago, year, a year and a half, somewhere in that range. So we've declined that much. Does that make sense? The entire thing. So sometimes you don't even know you're in a recession and then you don't even know when you're coming out of a recession either. Okay. So he makes this investment in the middle of a recession, essentially. Now we know it's the tail end of the recession. But still, he didn't know that, right? You don't know that when you're in it. You just don't, sometimes don't know, okay? Jim Rogers, he's actually speaking at our event, which is so cool, okay? 30 years old, co-founded the Quantum Fund with George Soros. In 1973, raised $6 million when he's 30 years old. Some, some people think like, oh man, I gotta be on Wall Street for 30. I could be 45 years old, gray hair launch fund. You, you can do that, but you don't have to. <laughs> this is the same Quantum Fund that broke the Bank of England. You know, this famous fund of Wall Street, Jim Rogers, one of the co-founders with George Soros. Crazy, come to speak at our event. He started the fund 1973, the beginning of a recession. Ends up being one of the most successful funds of all time. Interesting, right? You would think that'd be the worst time to start a fund. It might be the best time to start a fund, right? Pretty interesting, right? Another example, Ray Dalio, 1970, uh, 1975, 26 years old, started Bridgewater. Pretty young. He, and then quoted by um, uh, an article on him, 1987 stock market crash was the major turning point for Dalio. So first off, he started his fund in a recession, 1975, this is a recession. The oil star, oil crisis happened with OPEC. Kind of what's happening today. Like we have a little bit of an oil crisis, right? 1987 was the major, the crash is what Dre Dalio says. He's like, that's what made Bridgewater what it is today was the crash, okay? Smart money managers love what's going on. They love volatility. They love the dips. That's what produces some of the best funds of all time is dips like this. So a little example for the next one. I talked to my dad about this. And my dad was like, he, so back in 2010, he had friends calling him up because he was in real estate, real estate fund. And they're like, hey, John, um, dude, I'm so sorry, man. I just want to call. I want to let you know I'm thinking about you. I love you, dude. Like, it must be tough for you. And my dad's like, what are you talking about? He goes, well, I've heard you're in real estate. I've heard real estate's really tough right now. And he's like, man, like, I just want to let you know. I think about you. If you ever need anything, let me know. And my dad's like, dude, this is the best time in the history of the world to be in real estate. He's like, you couldn't pick in the last hundred years. I couldn't pick a better time to be in real estate than 2010. And his friends were like, oh, uh, oh, okay. He's like, dude, we're, we're killing it, man. This is the, we're so excited. He goes, I'm working like crazy. It's the most exciting thing I've ever done. We're buying up deals on the cheap. It's so awesome. And they're like, oh, it's pretty interesting, right? Isn't that kind of an interesting perspective? Like right now, people in the crypto space, like Bridger, man, crypto is tough. Sorry, dude. I'm like, no, dude, we are so excited. We are buying crypto so cheap right now. It's amazing. Okay, that's what, that's what I'm kind of talking about here. Last example, Jerome Kilberg, 51 years old, so kind of older. Started KKR. KKR is one of the largest firms in the world for private equity. They own most of the brands that you guys will see around. A lot of them are owned by KKR. Crazy. Um, he started at the end of a recession. So again, we have people that started at the beginning of a recession, middle of a recession, or end of a recession. I don't, right now, I don't know exactly where we're at in that cycle. If people predict whatever, all that kind of stuff, I don't know. We're going to talk about actually in a second. Um, but the biggest thing is they had capital ready to deploy in these downturns. They had a fund. They had capital. They didn't wait they deployed, they leaned into the challenge and it produced some of the wealthiest individuals to ever walk the earth is what produced out of a downturn right now. Because this is the time. People, we've been waiting for this for years. When's the crash coming? It's, it's like now. 
we are in it right now, which is so freaking awesome. Um, great example, Sir John Templeton. This guy is incredible. He, in 1939, borrowed a few thousand dollars to invest in US stocks in a dollar. This is in the middle of the war, okay? Or uh, early of the war. And then during the war, he invested more. He bought any <laughs> any stock under a dollar just because that's what he could afford. He, he wanted a diverse spread. This made him a billionaire because he, he predicted the United States would win the war. And that's, he just bet on US stocks. And he was right. They won the war. He's known, this is the old, this is the guy that's known for saying, avoid the herd, buying when there's blood in the streets. He then gave over a billion dollars to charities, died when he was 2895 years old. Incredible human being. Tony Robbins talks about this guy in his books, all because he leaned into a recession or a downturn, okay? Now, take everything they say with a grain of salt. So real quick, I want to talk about, anybody remember this? Bill Ackman on CNBC. Take everything they think. So right now you go on the news, people love to talk about doom and gloom, recession, uh, like it's craziness, right? Take everything they say with a grain of salt. They, they might be pushing their own agenda. They might be trying to change Jerome Powell to change rates with the Fed, or they might be cha- trying to change what the White House does by going on a new station. So for example, this happened in our life. One of the greatest trades of all time, in my opinion, happened during COVID. You guys, did you guys remember this? This was crazy. So Bill Ackman gets on CNBC, okay? This is March of 2020, okay? So he gets on CNBC and this is right. Remember when COVID was kind of coming out and you're like, well, I've heard about this virus. Is it, is it bad? Is it not bad? Like what's going on? And this is before the NBA shut down, before anything. This is right at like the tipping point area. Bill Ackman, who's one of the largest well-known fund managers in the world. And you guys maybe don't know him. I know him. I look, he's a crazy dude. Friends, this huge fund. He gets on CNBC and says, hell is coming. He goes, I've already been in lockdown for a month. He goes, this thing is going to tear apart markets. I mean, I am, he goes, I am, he just talks doom and gloom. He's scared. He's like, man, this is going to be crazy. Bill Ackman, a lot of people think triggered the major sell-off of 2020. If you guys remember the, this chart, it dropped like drastically. The NBA shut down, all these uh, sports teams, they shut it down in March Madness, like everything shut down. You guys remember this? Market went like crazy down. All triggered, in my opinion, by Bill Ackman on this one interview. You're like, man, this is one of the largest fund hedge fund managers in the world. He's scared to death. Like, I'm scared too, right? Little did everyone know, Bill Ackman had a 20, uh, $27 million short on the market. Right here. This is from Forbes. He made $2.6 billion from that one trade. Freaking crazy, okay? One of the greatest trades of all time happened in about a three-week time period. That was about three weeks. That's how far the market fell. uh, fell. He had a $27 million short on the market, made $2.6 billion in three weeks. Come on, people. Freaking insane. Number one, coolest trade ever, in my opinion. One of the best trades of all time. Number two, though, take everything they say with a grain of salt. When you're watching the news, when you're watching other stuff, and these like the CEO of BlackRock or Blackstone, they come say something publicly, they might be trying to push an agenda that helps their fund, okay? <laughs> Take things, watch what they're doing. Do what they do, not what they say, okay? Um, is that kind of is that kind of helpful? Kind of a cool trade though, right? Um, Warren Buffett right now as well. He was sitting on tons of cash. He's now dumping. He's buying so much stuff during this crash. Anyways, watch what they're doing. How they're doing. Find asymmetrical risk. Now I'm gonna talk about this and we'll do Q&A right after this. Find ace. You might be sitting there like, well, Bridger, I know Pete Davidson can date Kim Kardashian, but what about me, right? How do I break through that glass scene? In all funds, what you're trying to do is find asymmetrical risk. There's this concept called the, the efficient market theory. The efficient market theory says that everything in markets is perfectly priced in. It's all perfect. And every data that's known, there's no way to find a strategic advantage in a market. And if you look at the statistics of fund managers, people like me and you that outperform markets over and over and over again, the, the odds are like a, a trillion to one that that's even capable with the efficient market theory, which I think is a false theory. What we do as fund managers, we find asymmetrical risk. You probably heard before, like high risk, high reward, right? Low risk, low reward. In the fund world, that's not always the case. We try to find asymmetrical risk means you have a high amount of return for a low amount of risk. That's asymmetrical risk versus reward ratio. Okay, is that making sense? Now you're like, Bridget, well, how does that, how do you do that? So for example, let's say me and you were going to go buy a business. Okay. We're going to, going to go buy this cool business. And let's say there's a certain amount of risk associated with reward for that business. Okay. We're just right here. So cool. We go buy, we have a risk and reward level. However, let's, let's just say we we got Elon Musk to be our business partner. 
Okay. So Elon Musk now joins, what do you think happens to the risk versus reward levels of that, that opportunity? If you were investing in that project, do you think the odds of success go up or down? Probably up, right? What do you think the amount of risk? Because Elon Musk, one of the greatest entrepreneurs of, our, of all time, the risk probably goes down a little bit, right? All of a sudden, just because we added Elon Musk, we now have asymmetrical risk versus reward. He was the difference. Is that kind of making sense? Is he following along so far? In our funds, typically, unless you have a crazy AI bot or algorithm, we, me and you are the asymmetrical risk. We are the biggest difference of a fund of, you know, you maybe real estate, there's a certain risk versus reward, but maybe you're, you know, the market so well, you know how to do properties in this area so well that you have relatively low risk for a pretty high reward. I'm going to take a chance on that, right? I actually think entrepreneurship is a, a asymmetrical risk. You can have relatively low risk. You have bankruptcy, all these things that capture you, but you have huge upside, huge reward when you're an entrepreneur, right? It's asymmetrical risk. The biggest thing that we and you can do is invest in ourselves. We become asymmetrical risk. We, if you can become more like in that scenario, like an Elon Musk type that can come in and lower the amount of risk and up the side of a reward, that's worth it. So for example, um, I'll just tell you straight up. I actively, that's why I congratulate to you guys for staying on this long. We're going to do Q&A in just a second, but you're educated, you're, you're investing in yourself. Me and you are the biggest asymmetrical risk that we can provide to a fund or an investment. Me and Mason have spent, we just totaled up, we spent 200, get this, on courses, coaching, mentorship. Because if I find somebody that's done something I've done before, like, dude, I'll just copy you. Like, let me just show me the path. I want the shortcut. We've spent $265,000 on coaches, mentoring, events, um, that kind of stuff. A quarter of a million dollars on coaching. You might say, that's crazy. That, that, that's so dumb. I would never spend that money. Well, okay. I spent it and we just raised $10 million for a fund. Our business has done 17 million in sales in three years. So was it worth it or not worth it? What's the return on my investment? I thought it was pretty good. If I go back in time, I'd spend it two times over. That's how good it was. We just joined a mastermind. It was a hundred, get this, $150,000 for one year. Mastermind, 150 grand. The reason me and Mason joined it, why? Because the dude that runs it, he runs a business exactly what we want to grow fund launch into. We were like, dude, well, he's already done it. Do you think if he gives us some tips, tricks, some shortcuts that we'll make more than $150,000 next year and we will have asymmetrical risk on our business? And we were like, yes. Okay, it's easy. It's an investment. That's all it is. I'm a huge believer in educating yourself and investing in yourself. Um, and I believe that's, the, that's where I'm at today. And I, I will continue to invest in myself because I know it sharpens the ax. It gets me to bigger rooms. To, it gives me proximity as power, the whole freaking thing. So um, on that note, we're going to open up Q&A right now. I want to answer some questions for you guys. You guys are amazing people. Um, last call we got, I think they opened up a couple, did they, they open up a couple more spots? I think for you guys, we keep filling up spots. So <laughs> if you guys want to learn about funds, how we worked, uh, all that kind of stuff, you want to come to our events, you want to grab those discounts. If you guys want to have us work on your fund with you or walk you through how a fund is and just see if it works for you. Um, you guys can hit the link below. I'm going to give you a one minute here. Grab that link. Okay. we got seven spots left. That's it. Okay. Seven spots left. Okay. So <laughs> it is getting shut out. So seven spots left. Um, final call here, funlash.com slash call. And then we're gonna open up Q and a grab that link. Mason will drop it in the chat as well. And you guys can see it there, but grab that link funlash.com slash call and, um, go grab seven spots. left. you guys want to talk to our team here, they're, they're open up now, like late night calls and weekend calls just to help you guys out. We, again, our mission is to help more regular people launch and scale investment funds that go and change humanity. Okay. It's our mission here at fund launch. And we want to help you guys do this. I want to help people launch funds. If you want to my help or partner with me, I, again, I run an active fund. I, uh, I'm a now partner on six different funds. Uh, we can help you across the board. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I just, I think it's more, more people need to understand about funds. More people like me and you need to understand how this game works. This is not reserved for the Ivy league elite. It's not reserved for the wall street people. Like people can, regular people can do this. We're living proof that regular people can get in this game and win this game and actually do well. And it's so freaking awesome. Okay. So you guys are amazing. Uh, final call Mason. We'll drop that in there. I think seven spots left. I'm sure they're going to be gone here in just a second. So grab those calls. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. Now I want to answer some questions for a minute and um, let's go into here. Now we have a lot of people on live. Um, if you can send me questions on the Q and a, not the chat. So use the Q and a function. 
send me questions on the Q&A. It's easier. And then also we are, we actually are live on YouTube and other spots. Mason will grab questions uh, from other places as well. Um, but put them in the Q&A section. That'll just help me a little bit. Um, yeah, cool. Okay. Let me go. Let me pull up my screen here. You guys ready? Drop some questions in. Um, let's, uh, let's pull them open. I'm going to pull up my whiteboard. Boom, bada bing. Here we go. By the way, has this been useful? You guys like this call today? And my voice is like gone. It's been, <laughs> I've been like yelling at the screen for an hour and a half or whatever, how long we've been on here. But, um, okay. Hope you guys like it. Hopefully it's useful. Um, all right. Share my screen here. Screen sharing is paused. Ah, good question. So day-to-day responsibilities. Um, great question. Um, they say what type of fund? Day to day of like a fund. Okay, that's what's it's kind of this is kind of cool about running funds. Um, now I'll I'll say launching a fund is is hard. This is not for the faint of heart. This is not just like oh set up a little YouTube like channel and make some money. Like it's it's same fund is a serious endeavor. By the way, that's not real estate. The guy you said real estate. Okay, cool. Well, I'll share for a few examples, but it's it's hard to set up and launch a fund. Now, once a fund is running though, it's usually not that crazy. Um, now it depends on your fund type. So some funds are, <clears throat> so actually, let me, I'll actually, this will help answer a lot of questions too. So I'm gonna give you kind of a framework and we're talking about, we're gonna answer your question in a second, but let me give you a framework first. So inside of a fund, there are, in my opinion, three main roles inside of a fund over here on the left. This is what I call the expert investor. This is the person that's really good at crypto or real estate or trading or buying businesses. Okay. This is this is the guy that sits in his basement all day and trades options, okay? <laughs> in the middle circle, we have what we call the fund manager, okay? This person's good at legal, operations, SEC, compliance. This is what I'm good at. I'm, I'm really good at this middle circle. And then finally, we have what I like to call the capital raiser or money raiser. This person is very well connected to money and can help raise capital. Typically, the person who's good at investing oftentimes doesn't know what, how to run a fund and or how to raise capital and vice versa. Like I had a guy last year call me, he's like, Bridger, I've got two billionaire friends that love me. They want to invest my deals, but I have no clue how to run a fund or even what to invest into. Can I like partner with you or one of your teams? I was like, dude, you got two billionaire friends that want to invest? Like, come on in, dude, let's do it, right? And he was like, he, this guy's a natural born capital raiser. So typically you bring in partners that have different skill sets. Now you could have three people that do this. You could have two people that cover these roles. You could have one person that covers all these roles, but all these three roles need to be filled. If that makes sense. Okay. And then eventually you'll probably become a slice of one of these three things. If that makes sense. Okay. So for example, in my crypto fund, my partner, Dan, he's really good at X. He's really good at crypto. I'm really good at this part. And then we both help do this together. We both raise capital together because I'm a decent, I'm actually a decent capital raiser. Okay. Does that make sense? So back to the day-to-day of a fund manager, what does it look like? So um, when setting, it depends on your fund. So the expert investor person, these guys are usually looking through new deals, new deals or servicing like existing deals, right? So if you're in real estate, you're helping run the current properties or, and, or you're looking at new deals. Okay. Fund manager section. This is helping if there's like new entities or legal contracts need to be set up. This is uh you know, filing like your quarterly reports. This is uh, making sure that you're getting right, like evaluations. And then in capital raisers, these guys are going to parties and events and meeting high net worth individuals and setting up, you know, trying to raise capital. So depending on your fund though, like it doesn't take, once it's running like a lot. Now some funds you're always trying to grow and you can, you can, you can spend a lot of time on them. Some funds that I know, uh, they work on it probably 10 hours a week once it's running. Like venture capital funds, they have a call. They do a, every Friday. They allow um, new people to pitch them on new deals. Um, and then anybody that wants to raise capital, like every Tuesday, they do a new, they do a call on Tuesdays. Anybody wants to invest, they do a call. You can talk to them about their fund. And then the fund manager on the, on the quarter mark, they do some stuff on the quarter. Like it's not that crazy. Other funds that are like day trading every single day, they're on the charts, they're day trading, right? It's a lot more intensive over here. Um, and then some funds, you know, you're always raising new capital and you're launching new funds and you're scaling. So it can come down to, you know, your level, but is that helpful a little bit? Can I see the roles? And by the way, it's very rare that someone's good at all these things. So find partners, be in a group, find a mastermind group. That's what actually we offer. We, when people join our group, we say, Hey, are you a fund manager? Are you a capital raiser? Are you expert investor? 
And if you're, what are you looking for as well? We've actually had a number of people in our black car group, like partner up. They're like, Hey, Oh, I'm really good at raising capital. You're good at real estate. Let's partner together. And let's, let's do this. So that's, that's anyways, I'm a partner guy. I like doing partnerships. Um, this is the fastest way to launch a fund. And the, I think the best way to break some of the responsibilities. People are wondering how these three are uh, compensated. How are they compensated? Great question. Um, let me go green. Okay. It depends. <laughs> like all business, this is like, it's kind of the question of um, like, what should my business partner get? Like how much equity percentage? And again, that comes down to negotiations. That comes down to who's bringing the value to the table, all that kind of stuff. And every partnership will be different. Now, I want to give you though kind of a framework. I, I think all of these partners should be incentivized by equity. And so when I, a lot of funds that I've researched and looked at, it's not perfect, but about a third of the equity goes here, about a third goes here and about a third goes here. Now, in some cases, this is two, maybe three people here. This is 10 people, let's say, and this is uh, one person. But still a third of the equity goes to all 10 of these people. A third goes to these three people and a third or a third goes to this one person for just for example. But it's about a third, a third. Now, sometimes it's that tweaks. And also, usually, you know, if everyone helps raise capital and everybody helps look at investments, like usually in a startup fund, everyone's wearing multiple hats. But if I was able to segment it, I would probably say about a third each. Is that helpful a little bit? It's not always perfect. And as you grow, that'll change and fluctuate. But again, that's a, a rule of thumb. It's not perfect. Again, it's not perfect. Sometimes this is 50% and this is 25, 25. You know what I mean? Um, just depends. But about a third is about an average. Good questions, you guys. Um, thanks for, yeah. Any other, Mason, just call them out. That'll be helpful for me as I don't have to look at all of them. Yeah, I was wondering how capital calls actually work. How does, what's the process like? When you're actually doing yeah, yeah. Let's talk about capital calls. So let's talk about like the actual nuts and bolts of like in a fund. So a couple different, um, well, let's, let's talk about this for a second. So there's, um, it's funny. I get a question. I have to explain like three things first to answer the question. So here we go. Is this, I hope it is helpful to you guys. There's, <laughs> there's uh, two different types of funds. It's called an open-ended fund and there's a close ended fund. Open-ended funds uh, start and they run indefinitely. A lot of hedge funds run this way. Like our crypto fund is an open-ended fund. And what happens is um, investors can come in and out of this on closing. So let's imagine this is a timeline. It's like, let's say every uh, six months. So this would be six months, 12, you have 18. So every six months, new investors can join and old investors can leave if they'd like. And you set up the rules. Maybe you, maybe they can only leave every quarter. Again, you write the Bible, which is cool. But just for example, this is how, this is how it could work and on open fund. And you just run indefinitely. At the end of every year, you do distributions. You pay out indefinitely, okay? The, on open funds, though, you need you are providing, you need liquidity. Kind of the difference is, let's see, my pencil not working anymore. Come on. There we go. Because if investors want to leave, you got to be able to provide. So a lot of stock funds, like I'll just sell some stock positions and I'll pay you out as an investor. Closed-ended funds are typically like in real estate funds. So you have the same timeline here, but you'll say, hey, we're going to run a like a seven-year fund. We're going to raise capital for the first um, 18 months. We're going to raise capital right here. As we raise capital, we're going to start deploying. We're going to deploy. And you can't pull your money out. Like it's because it's deployed. It's in real estate. We can't just sell the real estate for you a part of it. Like it's deployed. You can't, it's a closed ended fund. We deploy. And then by year, let's say by year five, we're going to start selling. And as we start selling, we'll then start sending capital back through distributions to you in the fund. Okay. So again, open ended versus closed ended fund. You can decide how you want to earn your fund again in your LP and PPM. Um, so back to capital calls, typically in open ended funds, when someone comes in, like you call a hundred percent of the capital day one. So if they, uh, if an investor committed a million dollars to you, you would put that like, okay, so we're doing a closing at the six month mark. It's called a closing. All million dollars is due that day. And we're going to start managing your account. Okay. In a real estate fund, let me, uh, I'll put it down here kind of below. Okay. So let's just say it's a real estate fund here, real estate. Well, we don't need all that capital day one because we got to find projects. It takes a little bit of time to find the right stuff. So what we'll do is we'll do smaller closings in here. So let's say you initially got pitched and you committed a million dollars and we've raised um, by this closing. Well, 
Yeah, that's fine. Um, well, yeah, I'll just use it. We have $10 million raised and you have raised 1 million of that or you're that yeah, as an investor, 1 million. So let's say we come right here. We're deploying and we found a property that we like and it's a $2 million property, okay? We're gonna call down $2 million of capital. So we'll actually issue, what usually happens, we issue a notice and it's like, hey, you have 10 days to wire the money in. And here's the wire instructions. We said, and we're calling down 20% of capital. So if you invested a, so $10 million, that's 2 million, right? If you invested a million, that would be 200,000. It's all pro rata based on your percentage of the fund. Does that make sense? So you, this investor puts in 200,000, the rest of the investors put in the, the total of $2 million. We then go buy the property for $2 million. And then let's say uh, two months later, we found another property and it's uh, $3 million. Okay. We're going to issue another capital call. We're calling down another 30% to total 50% of the fund will be called down. We're going to call the capital down. We send a notice, the wire comes in. This and you know they that would now be five million dollars total, um, and then this investor would put another three hundred thousand dollars in, which would total five hundred thousand dollars. Does that make sense? So you can do, and then as you're, you can actually do this while you're raising money. So in these little check marks I put right here, right there, you can actually do closings and start buying properties here. You can buy properties here. You can buy keep buying properties and do closings, and then you um, keep raising money, rebalance the fund. I can dive into that if you want me to. Um, that's kind of how you do a capital call to answer this question. Is that helpful? Okay, other questions. Let's pull this up here. Good questions, you guys. Can you raise funds from non-accredited investors? Yeah, so can I raise from non-accredited investors? Um, it depends. Okay, it depends on your fund type. So um, we have other, I won't get too deep into this. We have other fun, other videos to talk about this. And actually in our course and stuff, we talk all about this. But you've got... Um, right here. So uh, sorry, real quick, before I draw this out, let's talk about, we have non-accredited investors. We have accredited investors. We have qualified uh, clients and then qualified purchasers. This is from the SEC. Okay. Uh, Non-accredited investors just don't fit in any category. Accredited investor has a million dollar net worth, or they make 200,000 a year or $300,000 a year with a spouse. One, two, three is an easy way to remember that. Um, and then also there's, they can take a test now and other stuff. Um, qualified client, 2.2 million. Qualified purchaser, $5 million net worth is in their home or a $25 million entity, an entity that has $25 million in assets, okay? So you have these different tiers of funds uh, or of investor types. So the question was, can, these guys are like less than, okay? They don't fit in any of these categories. Most people fit in these, any of these, okay? Um, so over here, we've got different, these are the most common fund types I'm going to explain to you. We have Reg, Regulation D506, okay? And then you've got B and C. And that's confusing, but that's the, that's the name of the SEC filing with these. They're called Regulation D506 B or 506 C, okay? Um, in a 506 B, you can raise, um, uh, well, we won't go through all the differences, but these are typically, you can raise from 35 non-accredited and um, up to, well, you're going to file a sub-filing, which is, anyways, I, I don't want to, I don't dive too deep, but there's sub-filings here <laughs> called a 3C1 exemption, 3C5, and a 3C7. Hey, we're, what the heck, we're on here. Why, we might as well go through it. Let's just do it. 3C7, okay? So you're going to pick, if you're doing a fund, like my fund, for example, is a Reg D. 506C, we'll talk about a C in a minute. I can raise, um, and then it's 3C1 exemption, okay? So um, let me just walk through this. Sorry, 35 non-accredited. And then this says unlimited accredited, okay? And then you cannot advertise, okay? This fund, a 506B. That's why most funds, you don't see billboards. You don't see them running ads because they, they literally by law cannot advertise their fund. Um, a 506C, you have to have um, only accredited investors. And then you, you can advertise, but you have to verify that they're accredited investors. Over here, they self-verify. So meaning in a 506B on the left here, a 506B, 
I just sent a little paper and you just, I said, are you a credit investor? And you check the box. Yes, I'm a credit investor. Okay. And I don't have, I don't have to check on it. I, I just, we trust it. You have the liability. Okay. And if I will succeed, I have to verify that you're an accredited investor. I actually need to, I have to get a, maybe your CPA or a lawyer that signs Joe Smith as an accredited investor signed by the CPA. And there's a, it's a, it's not that hard, but there's a few things that you can do that. So in my fund currently, I have to verify every investor that comes to me as an accredited investor. Okay. Now, um, the reason I do these is because, and then, sorry, and then I'll go to a 3C1 exemption underneath that. A 3C1 exemption limits me to 99 investors. A 3C5 is for real estate. And a 3C7 is 1,999 investors, but all of them need to be qualified purchasers. Interesting, right? So back down here, all of them have to be qualified purchasers. If I'm a, if I'm a 3C7 fund, I can raise from 1,999 investors. This real estate fund, it's actually kind of a cool, cool exemption. 1,999 investors for a real estate fund. And they, they just need to be, um, I believe, accredited or above. Okay. Um, and then 3C1 is 99 investors and they need to be accredited as well. So most funds raise, that's why most funds, and the reason you use these exemptions because they give you a lot of leeway and a lot of flexibility. They're actually really awesome. This is a great exemption. You're exempt from uh, filing like a public company. You're exempt from all these reporting. Like, it's really great. That's why most 99% of funds fall under Reg D, 506B, 506C, and then they use a 3C1, 3C5, or 3C7 exemption. Kind of cool, right? Um, this is, hopefully this is helpful. You guys, am I going too far? Is this good, you guys? We, you guys follow along? Okay. So um, I'm giving you guys kind of the, the, the secret sauce, I guess, a little bit here. So um, on here, again, these are for accredited only, okay? Um, all of these different types. Um so let's go down to other, somebody asked, can I raise from non-accredited? That's why most funds use this. And now you'll kind of get a reason why. A different fund type is what's called a reg A and another one's called a reg CF. Reg, so we have reg Ds, we have a reg A and then a reg CF stands for crowdfunding. You guys seen like crowdfunding, like Grant Cardone does a crowdfunding platform. Fundrise does a crowdfunding platform, okay? How these work, um, we won't go into all specifics, but the... Um, kind of some general rules for both of these actually. So I'm going to put a little, well, let me erase, I'll erase this line here. So how both these work, oh, where's my pencil? You, um, you, can, you can raise money from non-accredited investors, but you have to pre-identify assets and you have to uh, fully disclose and it's similar to like running a public company. If any of you have ever worked for a public company or ran a public company, these st- I, I, I did finance for a public company in Silicon Valley for a while. These statements are scrutinized like crazy. You have to publish perfect. You have to have things audited. You need an army of accountants to do this, um, to fully disclose like a public company. And you have to pre-identify assets. Up here, if I run a real estate fund, a 506B, I can just say, hey, we're raising 5 million bucks. We plan to go buy properties over the next 18 months. It's called a blind pool. We don't, we already, we haven't found, we found maybe one or two assets. We plan to go find another dozen of these, but we don't haven't identified them yet. In, in a reg A or reg CF, you have to identify the assets, get due diligence done, and then file. And like, so if you go to like Cardone Capital, he has identified assets. They've already done the due diligence on, they're raising capital for right now which is fine. Sometimes you lose those deals too, too, because it takes too long to raise money. Okay. This is going to cost you a lot more of maintenance. Cost is way up. You need to hire, like Grant Cardone has a lot of accounts. You need to go big if you're going to do this. Additionally, so Reg A, or this is called, they call it like a mini IPO, what they call this. And this is called, this is crowdfunding. Both can work. Um, additionally, uh, we all looked at the stats. It was like the average investment on a reg CF is like $460 or something like that. That's the average investment. So to raise a million dollars, you need, uh, somebody do the math for me. It's like 15,000 investors or something like that, right? Um, somebody do the math for me. I'll just put 15,000 though. 15,000, let's just say, for example, whatever you're raising for, that's a lot of tax statements. That's a lot of phone calls. That's a lot of people bugging you about, oh man, like, 
uh, can I get my money out? Or when, when does it close? Like that's a lot of customer service. Again, I mentioned this cost, your monthly cost to run this is high. And so in, for example, in my 506C, uh, we raised a million dollars. We actually have two investors that have just given us a million each. It's like two people I get to deal with for $2 million. Or I could deal with 15,000 people who are, and you guys know the whole statement. Like it's funny, I, I ran a fund, um, my first fund, I took a, I took a, so sorry, side story. We had a non-accredited investor. Um, I, I think we did a, this 506B one over here. He gave me $5,000 for, for one of our, we were raising some stuff. He, it was like on a Thursday. He calls me next Monday. He's like, Hey, how's the five grand doing? I'm like, it's good. We're just getting started. Like, no worries. He calls me on Friday. Hey, I, I got my mortgage coming up. Like how long do you think I'll get the money back? Like what's going on? And I'm like, dude, this is not right for you. Like you're out. And I, I sent him his money back. He was such a headache the first week. My other investor that gave me a quarter million dollars, dude, wire sent. Awesome. Good luck. Like you're going to, you're going to kill it. Send him a quarterly statement. He's happy as ever. Like it's so much easier dealing with high net worth. They understand the game of investing and um, people that are investing $460 just don't get it. And so it's a lot, it's a lot of work is what I'm trying to say. You can do it. We have people in our group that do it. Just understand the amount of workload that goes into it. And you need a lot of capital. And so the plan, if you're going to raise from non-credit investors, I would have a game plan like Grant Cardone, like Fundrise. You're going to run a multi-million dollar company. You're going to have operations. You're going to be spending uh, 500,000 a month on ads. You're going to be running ads like crazy. I mean, that's, if to make it make sense to cover the cost of running this, you need to be running and have that big of a team and customer support. And like, you're gonna have a whole floor of people. Like it's a big operation to get the same result as you could get from, you know, raising from five investors in a blind pool. That's why most funds do a 506B or 506C. Is that helpful? One of the things I'll share with you, it's kind of a cool story. Um, this little number right here. So three C7s are capped at 1,999 investors. This is why I shared like Ray Dalio or Jim Rogers, Jim Simons and these big investors. Ray Dalio, I believe he closed his fund in 2005. This is in Tony Robbins' book. So I'm, that's why I'm quoting this from. Hasn't raised new money since 2005. To invest when he was raising money in 2004, 2005, to talk to him, you had to have a $4 billion net worth. Minimum commitment was $100 million committed to the fund to invest in their fund. Crazy. And he hasn't raised new money since 2005 because you know why? He only has 1,999 spots. So he's like, well, I better get, I better get the most bang for my buck. So minimum commitment is $100 million. And you have to have a $4 billion net worth to even talk to us. Pretty crazy, right? And they manage, it's something like, they manage like currently like 258 billion right now or something like that. It's wild. Okay. That, the reason for that is because he, by, by law, can't go over 999. Because what the SEC is saying is once you hit, you don't have 2,000 friends. You're, you're a public company once you have 2,000 investors. If you have more than 2,000, like a crowdfunding, you need to file and register like a public company. And so because of that, and then it, it takes away a lot of the flexibility because in a, in a fund, you have control. In these, these top funds, I can decide a deal tomorrow and go buy it. In the Reg A or Reg CF, I've got to, I've got to do due diligence. I've got to post it to my investors. They've got to invest one by one into the platform. And anyways, just slows down your speed. Again, pros and cons both work. Um, I've actually seen a ton of companies recently do Reg A for like, they raise, they're raising money for like a startup. They do a Reg A offering. Like you'll see us on Instagram. I see like, uh, it's like these drone flying cars invested to our Reg A is what they're doing. And they can, and they can publicly advertise on a Reg A. It's kind of cool. All right. Woo. Long answer, big questions. That okay? Sorry, I got. I like getting the weeds though. You guys can tell I freaking geek out on this stuff. So there you go. Hopefully that's helpful. Again, not legal financial advice. Go do your own things. But I'm just giving you the data. What what's helpful? How are we doing, Mace? <clears throat> yeah, should we do some more, man? Woo! I need a drink of water. Let's see who's got some good. Let's see. Let's answer a couple more here. What do you think? A couple more. We'll, we'll wrap up. Um, great question. So what licenses do I need to run a fund? Um, it's kind of cool. Okay. You ready? Um, the answer is uh, yes and no. <clears throat> so it depends on the fund you're running and it depends on the size of fund you're running. 
Um, so talk to a lawyer, whatever legal team you use and ask them if you need one, but I'll just give you a, a general rule of thumb of how to think about it. To, for example, though, I currently hold zero licenses and I've run three funds. Okay. So this is a cool thing about funds. So back to, I'm going to draw this out for you. Um, remember you have your general partner, limited partnership, and you have your investors or LPs over here, right? Investors. Okay. Um, you then, I mentioned over here, you sometimes have a management company and these are owned by the same people. So let's just say this is me and you, okay? We're partners, we're running these together and we own the general partner and we own the management company. The um, <clears throat> In a fund, it's actually pretty crazy. The only license you would need, now some there are some differences, but um, pretty much the only license you would need is if you're running a management company, this management company, you're going to file as an investment advisor or a registered investment advisor. This is like, you know, like your brother-in-law that's like, hey, I'll manage your money for you. Like, they're, you know, those people like they work at like mutual, like Merrill Lynch or whatever, and they're going to manage your money. That's an investment. They become a registered, uh, a, a registered investment advisor, a representative. Okay. So you would make this company an, an investment advisor. Now this company, this management company advises the, we don't have clients like outside clients. We only have one client. The client is the fund. We give, the management company gives in the investment advisor slash management company gives investment advice to the fund. And in return for that investment advice, they're paid a management fee for in, investment advice. And to give investment advice, you need to be licensed. So you need to have a series 65 license. There's a couple other ones you can get, but the most common is a series 65 license through FINRA. Okay. When you have a series 65, you can set up your own shop, your own business that gives investment advice, which is called an investment advisor. Okay. And you're, you would charge a management fee. Now, the differences between these two registered investment advisor is any investment advisor under $150 million under a registered investment advisor is over 150 million. If you're over, you file with the SEC. If you're under, you file with the state. You do not file with both. Kind of crazy. You are either in the state level or the SEC level. All right. So <clears throat> what's cool is a lot of the funds in, in our group that we're launching are under 150 million. You fall into the state level. A lot of states don't require you to have a license, depending on your state, every state's a little different. Again, talk to your lawyer and ask like, Hey, I'm in like, and it's where your primary business is located. So I'm primarily located in Utah. We ran with our lawyer. He ran through for a crypto hedge fund in our state. We could charge management fees without a license. Kind of cool. And we actually, we, we filed as an exempt reporting advisor which means we're exempt. We still file, but we're exempt from being an investment advisor or a registered investment advisor because we're an exempt reporting advisor because of the category and, and the state that we're in. Kind of cool, right? I'm getting a little technical with legal stuff. That's ask your lawyer about this, um, see if you qualify. Um, people might ask, well, Bridger, like what if I'm trading? Do I need a series seven? Like if I'm running a hedge fund that's trading options or whatever. Um, typically, most hedge funds do this. They set up a, they work with a prime broker. This could be Credit Suisse, Goldman Sachs. I'll just put Goldman Sachs here, okay? Your fund is here. You're making trades. You will make the trade through your prime broker and then you make the trade. The prime broker holds all the series sevens and licenses and all that kind of stuff. All you would need to hold potentially is a series 65. Depending on your state, you might not even need to hold a 65. Kind of crazy, right? Um, again, talk to your lawyer now. So just give you a rule of thumb though. Um, venture capital funds, you almost never need a license. Just again, rule of thumb. They have the best lobbyists. Think about it like this. Like the government likes venture capital because it's it's investing to startup businesses. They want more people to invest in the startups and create more jobs, okay? The next tier would be um, like real estate funds. Real estate's not technically a security. Um, and a lot of real estate funds, like you don't need a license to run a real estate fund. Again, in general, talk to your lawyer, make sure it's... Uh, the next tier would be um, like private equity. Some states require private equity, some don't. And again, it's only the 65. And then after that, you kind of have the most scrutinized is hedge funds. 
a lot of the, it depends on the state, but a lot of fun, a lot of states want you to have a 65 uh, if you're running a hedge fund. So it depends on the fund type you're doing. Isn't that kind of crazy? Um, so kind of cool. Um, but again, this is why like it's cool to run the 506Bs, 506Cs because you can get out of licenses and all this other stuff. These ones you have to register. There's a lot more scrutiny that happens in a Reg A or Reg CF if you're going to raise from non-accredited investors. The way the SEC looks at it, in my opinion, is hey, if you're raising for somebody who's already a millionaire, they understand the risks of investing. And you know what? If they lose money, they're gonna they're gonna be okay. But if you take a thousand dollars on it from a non-accredited from grandma who's a non-accredited investor and you lose that money grandma may not be able to buy, buy groceries next month and we're going to come throw you in jail like that's they get mad if you lose the rich people's money they're like ah, we don't i mean we don't care as long as you didn't commit fraud we don't care um, but if you lose somebody that has a that's like you know broke you lose their money the sec gets really mad and comes after you just kind of a rule of thumb um so uh is that helpful licenses kind of a crash course. Again, uh, just so you guys are aware, by the way, in our, we have courses and stuff. The stuff I share today and the stuff you see on YouTube is about 20% of all the videos and stuff we make. Isn't that crazy? We, I put out a lot of videos, I think at least. Uh, it's only about 20%. If you guys go into our courses, our group stuff, we have like 80%. The other 80% is in there and we teach all this kind of ins and outs. We answer questions. We do this forever and ever. It's like, it's really fun. So, um, okay. Good question, you guys. Um, we'll do... Uh, Mason's like, tell me one more drop for calls. We have a couple people that want the link again. So one more call for, for calls. I think, I think there's a few spots. Are there spots or no? Four spots. Okay. Four. Okay. Wow. So a um, couple Scott spots left. We're going to drop the link right now. So if you guys want to book a call, if you guys want to learn how this all works, if you want us to work with you and help you through this, if you want to work with our team or coaches, whatever else, uh, we have all sorts of cool stuff. Book a call with my team. They're all literally sitting right there. They're all trained by me. There's only five guys that take calls from us right now. Cause they, we want really good people taking calls and, and you guys can hop on them. If you book a call, show up. If you book a call and don't show up, I'm coming after you. I'm going to come, I'm going to come toilet paper, your house and, you know, throw eggs on your porch and other stuff. Okay. Make sure to show up. Like these guys are putting like their weekend on the line right now and late nights, like to take calls for you guys. If you book a call and don't show up, like, actually we have a, we actually have a system. We, uh, we might, we actually can blacklist your email as well. Um, like it really bugs me when people don't show up for calls that my guys are waiting to like top on a call with. So, and you're also taking a spot away from somebody else that could take a call. So if you, if you book a call, put it in your calendar right now, so like set a reminder, come ready as well. Like have notes ready to go, like be prepared. So, um, there we go. Um, all right. Okay, other questions here. See any other ones? Good one. Um, yeah, rule of thumb. Yeah, put in there. Yeah, I know I say rule of thumb. Guess what? Nobody knew what that meant. It's like ancient. It's just a phrase you use, like the general rule, right? And now people today that are like, oh, it means that means to beat your wife with the stick. It's only that width or whatever. Okay, I get it. I probably should say a general rule, but at the same time, no one knows that in today's culture unless you bring it up and tell and you're trying to educate people. It's like it's not like it's an offensive term to somebody until you bring it up and you make it offensive. So I think there's a there's a way to take offense and have offense. Anyways, um, I'll keep. I'm gonna still. I I worked at a company in Silicon Valley. And they're like, you guys can't say rule of thumb. You can't say uh, guys. You guys because it's a jet. And I was like, dude, I don't know. I think in a society, I to me. When I say guys, I mean guys and I mean men and women. I mean they, them. I mean everybody. It just is a general term. That's how my culture is. So again, you can you can hear me rant on that, but I'll keep saying it. <laughs> you guys are awesome though. Um, because that's just how our I don't know, I, uh, unless you make something offensive, it can become offensive. So um okay. Well, you guys are awesome. I think we've answered most of the questions here. And my voice is like dying. Can you hear it kind of dying out? Um, <laughs> it's like going to be scratchy tomorrow. Thanks. Yeah. Not, don't take offense. I'm not taking offense either. I don't take offense too much. Um, but uh, just, just so people are aware. That's why I say, I'll just say, I'll say whatever, as long as it's not, I'm not, I don't want to offend people, but it's stuff like that. I'm like, dude, it's only offensive if other people make it offensive. Um, 
Good. Yeah. Final question. That's a good question. Why can't Ray Dalio repeat funds and just do duplicate funds? It's because if you have the same strategy, especially for, it's only really for hedge funds because they're buying the same things. You can't have um, an integrated offering with multiple stacked funds. And so now in real estate, you can though. So real estate, because of their close ended funds, you can have like fund one. And then two years later, you launch fund two and then you launch fund three and a couple years later, and then launch fund four. So you'll see funds like we're on, um, you know, office building fund six. And the reason they can do that is because they're buying different office buildings. There's different risk associated with each one. If you're in a hedge fund, though, it's the exact same straight trading strategy. You can't just copy and paste it because the markets are so it's the exact same risk. But in like venture capital, you see firms like we're on venture capital fund seven. And because there's different portfolio companies in each fund. So that's why they can do it. All right. You all are amazing. Um, good to hang out today. Final call, funlash.com slash call. You guys can go grab a book a call. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Um, if you like this call, by the way, if you can, um, take a picture of me real quick or you and tag me online. Say what's up. I'll retag you. Say what's up. Whoa, I'll give you a thumbs up. Hey, there you go. <laughs> but uh, say thanks to Mason as well. Mason did so good on the back of this call. Um, you guys are amazing. Are we sending out a recording of this, Mason? Yes. Okay, so look out. We'll send a recording of this tomorrow morning uh, via email, I believe. So if you guys are on an email list or whatever, if you opt into this, um, you'll get an email. It should be come out tomorrow morning. Um, if it doesn't come out, send me a DM or something. We can send you the replay um, or send us a, an email. By the way, you can always email us, bridger um, at funlaunch.com. Send me an email if you guys uh, have questions or other stuff or go book a call. Or if the thing doesn't come tomorrow, just send, them, send us a message at bridger at funlaunch.com. Um, okay, you guys are amazing. Fun hanging out today. I got to get my voice all uh, feeling good, but you guys are awesome. Um, good job today.